Welcome back to Tampa City Council. Roll call, please. Carlson. Hertek. Here. Clendenin. Henderson. Henderson. Present. Thank you. <laughs> Vieira. Here. Miranda. Here. Maniscalco. Here. You have a physical quorum. Thank you very much. We're going to start off with item number 65, and we have Miss Malone. Go ahead, ma'am. Good afternoon, Council Members, Jennifer Malone with your Planning Commission staff. Um, we have a, um, a letter from the Planning Commission and a memorandum in your packet where we kind of have outlined, um, this is about the Tampa Comprehensive Plan update, specifically the future land use assessment where we kind of outline everything we've been doing since we came to you in September. So since September, if you might recall, we've been working with an independent consultant with Pritchett Steinbeck Group to come up with some recommendations for our future land use assessment. Um, we heard what you said. We think that we are working on addressing all of the all of those ideas. Um, there will be we are synthesizing those and we're going to incorporate everything into draft language. We are going to be hosting outreach later this year, as we did with the other sections of the comprehensive plan update that have moved forward. Um, so so far, we have mobility, environmental, and one water have all been before you, and each of those we had some outreach meetings along the way for the public. So that is forthcoming. We're just writing policy. We're going to come back to you with outreach meetings, and then we'll come back to you with the language later this year when it's initiated as a plan amendment. Um, this is a very important section. Um, there's a lot of interest in it, so we're certainly open to suggestions on moving forward on that on that process. Um, so we're happy to answer any questions about the work that has been done to date and any next steps in the process. Councilmember Clendon. Thank you for being here today. I'm very happy that you guys have gotten to this point and I look forward to uh, sending this back with uh, you know council's blessing for you guys to get the actual language working so that we can go through this process and, and have an actual document in front of us. And uh, congratulations again for all the work that's been done behind the scenes for you and everybody else on the team. Thank I know you. It's, 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 a, it's a very big project, and it's going to be very important to the city of Tampa and our growth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I want to echo what Councilmember Carl... Um, Sorry, we're mixing you up today. The two of you, I don't know why. Um, Councilman Clendenin said, uh, I particularly like the table, and I also like the city of Tampa's table. I thought it just made it really clear. And for the public, just knowing that we're going to have more conversations as we put this language together, mm -hmm. I just want to really thank you. I think it's, uh, um, it's an exciting time to be here. Thanks. Yep. And I was remiss to mention the great work we've been doing with Stephen Benson and his department. Um, you know, we wouldn't be in front of you with these ideas if we didn't have his input and his brain power as well. So. Mr. Shelby? Uh, just a curiosity because I saw you referencing something um, and I'm looking at on base and I don't see it under this item number on on base. And I'm wondering, is it something that you gave to the clerk to be able to upload? No, and I thought I checked on base and saw that it was in there. It, it, it is it in there. This, this item was continued from January. so. That might be oh, okay. why, but, so but it, it was in the backup in January. It should be still be in the backup for this one. Okay, I'll double check. Thank you. Yeah, right. that's, a, that's a good question to find out what we do in the future with continued things. But I, I could have sworn I saw it in there, but I okay, guess not. Well, All right. I could have missed it, but I'll double check. Thank you very Is much. Is that the entirety of item 65? <laughs> All right, you don't need That's, any action from us? We don't need any action. It's just an update. Unless you'd like to make a motion for something, you don't have to, but that was the entirety of it. We're Thank you very giving much. giving an update. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Vieira, did you speak to Chief Tripp? Yes, I did. I was actually going to say that. Thank you, sir. So for the two fire items, I'm fine with the um, memo. I, I was uh, communicating with Chief Tripp and telling her that she spent enough time in Tampa City Council the last few weeks. And um, what I was going to do is briefly talk about those and have them come back to us. I, th th they do bring up some issues that I want to speak with her that I don't really believe we need to have that conversation in here. So um, when they come, I'll talk about them, but I do not. And unless right. the council. Is this 57 and 58? Y yes, sir. All yeah, right. So you want to move to receive and file? So yes. But if I may, when they come, I do want to talk about them and what I'm going to do whenever the time comes. But not today. I mean, yeah, whenever, are they up now? No, 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 no. I'm just saying, uh, okay, we'll, we'll get to it when yes, we get to it. Yes, but in other words, okay. I do not need Chief Tripp or anybody from TFR here okay. uh, today as I communicated to Okay. Okay. So we're going to go now to item number 55, Mr. Harvey. Good afternoon, Council. David Harvey, Legal Department. Item 55 is a resolution uh, authorizing settlement of the Robert Dubois versus City of Tampa case that's pending in federal court. 
Um, as we discussed at a closed session on February 1st, the tentative settlement would be a payment of $14 million payable over three installments. Um, for the reasons we discussed at the closed session, um, our office is recommending settlement, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Are we allowed to make any comments after this vote is, uh, is taken or no? Yeah, I think after the vote, it's fine. Okay. Any council members wish to make this motion um, or have any questions? I'll, I'll make it or that I... We have a motion from council member Vieira with the second council member Miranda. Is there any discussion? If not, we can do a, a roll call vote because of the amount. All right, roll call vote. For this is 55, moving the resolution. Hertzak? Yes. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Carlson being absent at vote. Is it appropriate to speak now? If that's council's pleasure, yes. Okay. I'm, I'm just speaking in my own personal capacity. I'm, I'm grateful that we have organizations out there. I know there's groups like the Innocence Project, and I know the state attorney was here earlier discussing how this came to be after 40 years. Uh, I'm born in 1984, and this case began in 1983. And I mean, that's a lifetime. You know, I'm almost 40 years old. So, you know, this is something that is, um, you, you can't imagine what it's like unless you're in those footsteps. But, you know, without getting into too much detail, I will say I think justice is, is rightfully served in this capacity. Um, a gentleman was, is given a second chance after much suffering, after much, how do you even put it into words? But at least there is a process where, you know, he can, he can go and live his life, although there are decades that are, that are unfulfilled. You know, what could his life have been? Uh, had the situation been different, but at least in this case, you know, us as a city council, you know, we've, we've voted to uh, approve this settlement, and, and I can say personally, not speaking on behalf of the city, you know, the best of luck, you know, to the gentleman, and, and I wish him all the happiness in the world moving forward. Anybody else? Councilmember, oh, Councilmember Vieira, Councilmember Clinton. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I uh, no, I, and I agree with that. And I wanted to, as you said, first off, acknowledge our uh, the, his former state attorney uh, Andrew Warren uh, for the great work that he did with his team on this. Um, it, it's you, you know, when you're a prosecutor, you have to be a, a, a thoughtful uh, prosecutor to you know go certainly go after crimes and, and and whatnot, but just make sure that things that have been done in the past have been correct. And this is something that was obviously incorrect and, and represented a great injustice. And I salute Andrew Warren as well as others. I believe former judge, uh, uh, second court district, uh, second district court of appeals judge, Chris Altenburn, I believe, uh, headed this uh, committee. I believe uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Warren's office. So obviously, my hats off there. Um, and uh, in the city attorney's office, everybody, including my, my friend and colleague uh, David Harvey, uh, you know your work on this, David. I'm sure you know you're you're a really good attorney and, and studious and, and detail oriented and so I know you put in a lot of time on this so thank you and Ms. Zellman and everybody and, and, and everybody's team um, but this is something that's very very important you know one of the things that you can do in public office is to make wrongs right and um, this was you know a, a big wrong uh, like uh, Chairman Maniscalco said many many years for this gentleman to be in prison uh, he was in prison I believe it was at the age of 18 uh, and, and the things that he suffered just, just from the life lost uh, is, is tremendous. And I hope and pray that this um, settlement gives him a, a measure of comfort. You know, when, when there, there are certain cases, and I say this as a 21-year lawyer, where uh, you settle um, and, and uh, you, uh, no matter how much money you get, you can never compensate somebody for the suffering that they go through. And I, I would obviously say this is one of those cases. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's certainly a gesture with the city of Tampa. And again, I, I, I hope and pray that we can begin to make wrongs right in, in this man's life, but this being a process, you know, everybody has a journey to coming home emotionally. And, uh, you know, I hope that this helps him in his journey. Sincerely, thank you. Council Member Clendenin and Council Member Miranda. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll echo my thanks to uh, elected state attorney Andrew Warren. Uh, for setting up the organization that led to the exoneration and, and, and the freedom of an unlawfully convicted 
um, individual. It, it's, 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 it's sad when somebody sacrificed so much of their time and energy, and I'm, I'm glad that the city is, you know, I guess, I guess I'll leave it at this phrase. It's never too late to do the right thing. And I believe that's what us as a city, we're standing up and doing, we're doing the right thing. So I, I hope this is at least in some way will we'll help this man um, move on and, and enjoy what the rest of his life. And I appreciate everybody that was a part of it. Thank you. Councilmember Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, 40 years, I guess, or close to 40 years, right at 40. Uh, what would you feel? How would I feel? Anyone in the audience would feel, those behind the camera, those writing the stories, how would you feel if you were in jail for 14,600 days and every one of them damn days you knew you were innocent? What did you miss? You miss seven eighths of your life that's gone away. The most productive years of your life are gone. And every day you slept in that bunk, you just told yourself, it wasn't me. And you come out and you say, what have I missed? Money can't buy anything. It can't buy a family that he didn't have. You can't see his children, his grandchildren, possibly. So money doesn't solve everything. But in a democracy, at least we've made an effort or a combined effort between the legal department and those representing the person to come up with some number. <clears throat> And you all done an astounding, uh, astounding job in, in doing that. But it, uh, I apologize for it happening. We didn't have anything to do with it. But you can't correct something that was 14,600 days being in jail thinking it was not me. Most of it would have been crazy by this time. But that's just me echoing what a democracy is about. It works. And sometimes you don't find them. There might be others that you'll never find. But we're talking one, one particular case here in Tampa. So I, uh, I apologize to the individual who had to serve that amount of time in jail. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, I will echo my uh, council members, uh, fellow council members. Um, you know, our state attorney created a wonderful program to really relook at some of these cases and in this case, he found that, or the, the department found that th there was a wrong done. And I think that having more of these units that work on this is really important. I don't think for any of us it was a question of a vote. Um, this person has, um, Mr. Dubois gave the majority of his life for this, and this is the least we can do. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Dewa, I am sorry that this happened to you at such a young age. I am the, close to the same age that you are, so that is a, my lifetime, and I am sorry, and hopefully this history, um, of course, correcting and getting it right by providing you with this settlement will give you some mode of happiness for you and your family. Thank you very much. Mr. Harvey, there's also a number 56 companion to this. Are you taking this up, or is it a CFO question? Well, Mr. Rojero is here to answer any financial questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Rojero. Good afternoon, Council. Dennis Rojero, Chief Financial Officer. Yes, this resolution will take care of the obligation in the current fiscal year, fiscal year 24, for the $9 million. Uh, you will see the obligations for fiscal year 25 and 26 as part of budget development later on in this year. Uh, again, they are standing obligations. We want to make sure we're uh, setting them aside in the, uh, the next two fiscal years. Anybody wish to move the resolution? Councilmember Hurtek. I'll, I'll move the resolution. Second. We have a motion from Councilmember Hurtek to move item 56. Second from Councilmember Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Okay. Next up is item number 52. We have a written report from Mr. Michael Perry. However, we have Mr. B-Day on, online and we received probably endless emails regarding this. Mr. B-Day, yes, sir. Oh, you're muted. Please unmute yourself, sir. Can you not hear me? Yes, we can. Now we can. 
Oh, okay. uh, Big B-Day Mobility uh, here to address item 52 related to uh, uh, certain changes in the budget relative to a FDD uh, grant in the amount of a little over $10 million. Uh, this grant is towards uh, the South Howard Flooding Relief Project. Uh, and this was, of course, one of two items that was discussed at the last meeting uh, where Councilman Carlson, in whose district this project is, requested that we meet with neighborhoods uh, that are impacted within the South Howard area uh, to listen to their concerns again, provide as much of an update as we can, uh, and then uh, report back. Uh, and on that note, uh, uh, you, you were correct, there's been a lot of correspondence and emails uh, from the neighborhoods. Uh, we did meet with all of them. We met with Hyde Park, uh, or rather Historic Hyde Park, Hyde Park Preservation, Bayshore Gardens, Parkland Estates, uh, and New Suburb Beautiful. Uh, for the most part, uh, and also the businesses, uh, and we do have a... So business alliance meeting scheduled uh, next week as well. Uh, that will be held at the Epicurean. Uh, based on all of our meetings with the communities, uh, we were able to share what updates we could at this time. Uh, I think there were a lot of concerns that were addressed. I'm sure there are additional concerns that the community still have. I know that they have individually shared letters with council also. Uh, the most recent one was an update by an email from Parkland Estates clarifying uh, the, the levels at which they would want updates as the design proceeds as well. Uh, New Suburb Beautiful has uh, 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 conveyed their opposition to this project. We understand that. I would like to provide some context to that. Uh, uh, and then we'll you know, move to any questions. Uh, given New Suburb Beautiful's concerns with the four parallel streets from Morrison all the way down to Watrous, uh, and the concerns with two potential work zones uh, on either end of their neighborhoods, very understandable. Uh, this, this neighborhood also has some of the worst uh, streets in uh, the city uh, based on pavement condition. There's a little bit of a history to it as well. I would like to clarify that New Suburb Beautiful is not within the basin that the project impacts, meaning New Suburb Beautiful drains into a different basin. There will be some work that will happen uh, in New Suburb Beautiful, specifically on Morrison, as part of early works. As far as route selection of how the pipes will be routed from uh, Parkland Estates uh, via uh, the neighborhoods onto Howard Avenue, that is part of an assessment that is part of the design process. So this is a design-build project. We haven't... Uh, uh, finalized our negotiations with the design builder yet, and that process hasn't begun. I think we were able to convey that very well to the neighborhoods. They did uh, understand that. They did understand at least, I mean, we, we made our best attempt to mention that we are committed to continuous engagement through this process. We identified our single point of contact, which is Michelle Robinson, a contractor that's working with us. Uh, at this time, and the process in which she will seamlessly hand over to the design builder and their uh, uh, contractors uh, as far as communications go. And both were uh, available at all of the meetings that we mentioned. Uh, we are also committed to sit down, and this is what uh, we offered New Suburb Beautiful. We shared what I'm sharing with you, that we will not uh, leave it there. We will sit down with the neighborhoods. We will go over all of the issues. At this point, transportation engineering will be the lead on that. And I know that our transportation manager, Brandon Campbell, is working uh, on getting something on the calendar with New Suburb Beautiful. And we'll start working on two things. One is low-hanging fruit projects that we can address 
today, right now, with uh, our budget, not part of the project budget, and I'll get into that in a second, uh, and then put together a business case for any grants that may be out there. As you all know, we've had some success over the last four years in attracting both federal and state monies, and we will we will uh, exercise the same kind of rigor in looking for opportunities for a new suburb beautiful. And if not, we will keep chipping away at it within the budget that we have and the resources that we have available. And I'd like to reiterate that because the South Howard project as design drains a different basin than new suburb beautiful, that system is available for future connections to other adjacent neighborhoods but New Suburb Beautiful just drains elsewhere. Uh, and then this grant that's in front of you, the $10 million item, which is basically a financial transaction because council approved uh, a receipt of the grant from FDEP at the last council meeting, can only be spent towards this project or be spent towards uh, uh, resiliency and sea level rise studies. Uh, so it's a very narrowly tailored grant. It is competitive. And I would just like to highlight that uh, not receiving these funds will not help you know, any of the challenges that have been uh, brought up or concerns that have been brought up by the neighborhoods. Uh, so I hope you consider that uh, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Bita. Before I go to Council Member Hurtak and then Council Member Clendenin, um, just a couple of things. Um, I was here in 2016 when I voted for, when we voted for the stormwater uh, capital improvement projects. And I know this is a grant, but part of that quarter of a billion dollar investment. Um, I remember talking to folks in that neighborhood saying, hey, if you don't support, because that was a swing vote. If you don't support this, the neighbor's gonna be mad because of the flooding in South Tampa in general. I did support it, long story I'm not gonna get into. And I've seen uh, some major stormwater projects take place since then. So uh, West Shore Boulevard, uh, Estrella, all that area, the Dale Mabry Henderson trunk line. Um, I've seen the Seminole Heights, which is still in progress. Um, and now we have this, uh, which again is, is, is to address stormwater, but there, there are investments that we need to make in our infrastructure because we have flooding issues, we have drainage issues. Um, however, I've received so many complaints, and it's part of it. It's part of the construction. You're going to get complaints. But, you know, that West Shore project, mm -hmm. that Dale Mabry Henderson project, people complaining about roads being shut down. I mean, I have, I have selfies on my, on my cell phone of me walking into the box culverts before they get installed, me going down there and, you know, listening to the neighbors saying we can't get in and out of our house, you know, the, the contractors, which have been great, you know, in that West Shore project, they were great, getting people in and out with golf carts and whatnot, but I saw the disruption in their, in their livelihood. Uh, traffic cutting through in areas that are, typically don't cut through. Roads closed, getting in and out, uh, access for ambulances, access to get kids to school. Um, it's, they're major projects and they're very disruptive, although they're necessary. With Seminole Heights, that's a completely different story. I mean, it's still ongoing road closures and construction and roads torn up. And this one here, whether it's a grant or not a grant, this is the $10 million grant that we're talking about. Um, I know that neighborhood very well. I went to school as a middle school student right there on Swan. Um, and I know the neighborhood very well. Uh, I know Howard Avenue very well. Uh, having said all that, in looking at what the city gave out at their community meeting, I think earlier this week, there was a map that showed basically a, a darker solid line at Swan and a dark solid line on Howard going to Bayshore. But then within the neighborhood, for example, going down Bristol, going down, I believe it's Lakeview, it's dotted. So I don't know if those are uh, possible routes or if there's uh, you know, room for negotiation here where we say, can't we just work on Swan and Howard and you know, work with the businesses and the community there? Um, because the community, for example, at Lakeview, where the gazebo is at, it's like a triangular piece, um, I heard from many neighbors, they say it, it never floods here and the drainage dishes are more modern style. It's not like, you know, one section off of, uh, 
I don't know, it, it, it's, I forgot where, but farther down, it has like a, a new grate, a drainage grate that was installed more recently in, 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 in the neighborhood. But the drainage ditches are, are modern there at Lakeview. Um, they say that there's never been flooding that they can remember, and these are folks that have lived there 20 years. Um, if you go down Bristol, it's a narrow road coming off Howard with a center median. Um, there's a lot of trees there. I, I walk through the neighborhood. Again, I'm, I've, I've been there my whole life, you know, visiting and, and going to school and stuff. But I walked through the neighborhood the other day, and a lot of those trees were there when I was a kid. So I imagine they're 50 years old, 100 years old. I don't know. My concern is, yes, we can replant what we can replant, but those trees have taken generations to grow and I know with construction when you dig up asphalt and when you do these kinds of you know when you're putting box culverts and pipes and everything you're going to damage your root system and people in those neighborhoods you know they they buy for several reasons one because it's a beautiful house second because it's a great neighborhood third the tree canopy we talk about this all the time but those beautiful trees you know they provide shade they they allow for the water to drain that you know the benefits of trees in general my concern is, can we avoid, can we mitigate having to go into those neighborhoods, going down Bristol, going down Lakeview, and focus on Swan and Howard, and no complete road closures, because I think we've, we're learning from that uh, in other stormwater uh, projects, but I think it's more manageable where we have a less, less of an impact on trees and on people, their livelihood, there's kids, I mean, there's just... There's so many reasons. Uh, I know that was a very long-winded uh, dis discussion on my part, but is there any wiggle room that we can avoid going into the neighborhoods? I think those are all excellent points, and we heard them as well, and they're very, very valid. I mean, communities are concerned about their uh, legacy structures and trees, as are we. I think the simplest way I can share right now is we're open to looking at all of the routes, Swan, uh, Bristol, Lakeview. Ultimately, and this is what we shared with the communities as well, ultimately, this will be uh, an engineering analysis that also takes into account tree impacts, uh, people impacts, light traffic, uh, uh, and then, uh, of course, cost and then uh, feasibility as well. Okay. And what I would like... Go ahead, go ahead. All right, what I would like to share or clarify is while the primary areas where flood mitigation or flood relief will be uh, most impactful is Parkland Estates and parts of Swan Avenue between McDill and Rome, more or less, this is a classic... Uh, uh, public works project that impacts the commons. And what part of the commons it will impact uh, is, is initially going to be an engineering decision based on the criteria we mentioned. And we're committed to being very transparent and putting all the information and the data in front of the community, in front of council, and make a recommendation. That recommendation will, will include three impacts. Uh, and it will include traffic impacts as well, uh, absolutely. And then on, on the part where, you know, one route will have to be selected, uh, and, and I don't know what that route is, we will do our best to put things back in place or mitigate as much as we can, with the exception of trees, understanding that, you know, uh, planting trees, uh, unless they're appropriate species, on top of the uh, system itself might present maintenance challenges or other challenges in the future, but we'll continue to work with all neighborhoods to focus on planting trees where we can, right species, right place. Thank you very much. So if, if this is to pass today and we move this resolution, will we have other bites at the apple as a council to say, hey, you know, this is, this is affecting people we want to change this or is this just going to be well you've approved the 10 million dollars we're going to move forward with the project and then you make the decision because i you know again i've been through we've been through several major stormwater projects we get inundated with calls and emails we've been out there to the sites we see how it affects people and it may not seem like a large area but it is howard avenue is long <laughs> from swan avenue um, new suburb beautiful 
they have concerns about the quality of their roads. We know that paving is an issue in the city of Tampa. In this current budget, we almost tripled the road paving budget. Uh, is there room here with $10 million in this grant that we can apply towards paving? Because as they've brought up concerns, even though it's a different stormwater system, because Howard is impacted or Swan is impacted, cars are gonna be going through those new suburb beautiful roads to you know, maneuver through. And I think it's right to say, you know, you're gonna feel more of the brunt because of the traffic increase. We should be paving your roads that are, they haven't been paved in decades. You know, that's, a, that's another question that I have. I think that if we're smart and we listen to the community, which is the right thing to do that, you know, we can lessen, we can mitigate the impact. We can get more bang for our buck. We can pave roads that need to be paved because a lot of, it's not just, you know, Lakeview, Bristol, Howard, and Swan that's gonna be affected. The surrounding neighborhood is gonna feel it. Again, I've seen it in, in the West Shore area. I've seen it in Seminole Heights. And I think we can, we can learn a lot from those projects and, uh, and do the best we can and, and, and make the right decisions here. Thank you very much. Council Member Hurtak, Council Member Clendenin. Thank you. Um, I did a tour with Parkland Estates last week and it was very clear that Bristol is just not a possibility. I wouldn't support that at all. Doesn't matter what happens. You can't just go into a neighborhood and pull out a park, um, which is basically what Bristol is. It's got a park in the middle of it. Um, so w I was shown the initial uh, renderings, which does take it from Swan to Howard. And I did talk to people from your department that said that that's something that you can certainly look at. And I, I look forward to seeing that. Um, unfortunately, as we found with the Southeast Seminole Heights stormwater project, not every street that's touched is an actual affected street. So the street that was shut down for almost two years, Crest, had no flooding problems. The reason that they had to do Crest because that's where all the water from Southeast Seminole Heights was going to, to go. So, um, so I think, again, when you meet with the community, those types of education is always helpful. Uh, I spoke to um, Brad Baird about updating council, and he said that this project will be included in the great eight projects that they bring back to us. I believe it's quarterly. Um, so the first quarter will get kind of like, so they said that there is a 30%, a 60%, and a 90% um, conclusion of, of, of getting this all set up. So we're at the 30%, and it's 60% should be about when our next grade eight um, update is, and 90% after that will be the next grade eight update, is what I was told. And I yeah. um, just one, just, and I was told that you would be willing to meet with the community after the project is 90% so that folks can see what is coming. Is that the case? Uh Actually, if I could clarify, we're we're not at thirty percent. We haven't even oh. started design yet. Okay, my apologies. So it will be several months to be at thirty percent, but thirty, sixty, ninety, absolutely, will come to council for the grade eight updates, and we will come any number of times to provide updates that council uh, uh, pleases. We'll be more than happy to do that. If anything, we've accounted for the fact that we need much more communication than we've done in previous stormwater uh, projects, and which is why we've required a stormwater uh, or a communications plan. And if the communities want to be more in touch than we have said, which is 30, 60, and 90% design updates, we're, we're, we're more than happy to do so. And all of the information that we receive, another concern that we had was there are different neighborhoods and different business associations, and they may all have different interests. We will we will collect all that data and make it available transparently on the on our website itself, so everyone knows what anyone else is asking for. Uh, and as far as resurfacing goes, we do have early works planned that will include resurfacing on several streets uh, around Howard. We know there's going to be impact during and after the project we have planned for post works as well so after the project we'll leave the neighborhoods in better shape than they are today and as far as some of the more challenging uh aspects specifically like new suburb beautiful uh i think given 
kind of the 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 history behind it and the the different things we're hearing that you know brick streets three impacts all of that we just like to sit down with the neighborhood really understand specific needs and our commitment is we're not going to let that go we'll have small projects every fiscal year if needed if we are able to get you know uh, a big chunk of funding through the state through the fed we'll look everywhere and we'll work with the neighborhoods you have my commitment on that our department is committed to that great and the other thing i wanted to point out that this 10 million is a very small portion of the cost to do this project um, so I'm, I'm very excited that we've got this to go toward this, but there is other money within the project that we can do other things. Uh, and then I just want to end with this. Uh, when I woke up this morning and I opened the um, Tampa Bay Times newsletter, one of the stories was residents of St. Pete complaining because they don't have um, any stormwater help coming their way. Uh, and so I am thankful that this was passed and that we are working on it. It is not fun to go through. It's not going to be fun to go through. But the help that we have seen, um, the actual mitigation has proven to be successful. So um, there is that. And I just want to say thank you to your team um, for making that happen. Uh, this is so important to us. And you know, really be, being able to stop and take that in. The other thing I wanted to say is that um, if you haven't already during these community meetings, you may wish to bring up the newsletter that uh, and the updates that are emailed to Southeast Seminole Heights, uh, storm, the, the folks who signed up for that email, just to show the kinds of information that people will be getting if they sign up for the newsletter. I think that can help um, allay fears as well, because to show the kinds of um, information that our the citizens in Seminole Heights are receiving so that they know so folks in um, this Swan and Howard area know the kinds of of information they will be getting and then possibly retrofitting it to fit their needs that's a great suggestion thank you and thank you for recognizing that these are generational projects these will benefit, you know, campaigns 50, 60, 70 years from now. And, and we recognize they're not convenient while construction goes on, uh, however necessary they are. I, I want to I echo Councilman Hertek and say, you know, thank you for the visionaries that served on previous councils and administrations that brought the stormwater improvements forward and got us to where we are today. <clears throat> We've got still years and years of work in front of us. But I think you know this administration and hopefully future administrations will manage that appropriately, and we'll see a much better Tampa and a much more climate resilient Tampa because of the work that had been done by previous administrations and previous councils. Um, Mr. Vidi, I have a couple of questions about this specific project, and I believe some of that you made to clarify, but I want to make sure I clarify it again. So, in this particular phase of this project, the route that may or may not impact uh, Parkland Estates. There is no definitive route yet, correct? That's correct. So this project may just may not include any of the residential streets, may just do Swan and Howard? That's a possibility. That's okay. one of the uh, routes considered. And from what I understand, and this is not this is not scientific, it's anecdotal from the neighborhood, that a lot of the impact that they have that they see coming because of the um, water movement pattern in this area of town comes from the neighborhood north of Swan and I mean, because I see that in my neighborhood, you know, we create a river coming past my house. They say a lot of this watershed comes from the areas north of Swan, flows past Swan and into Parkland Estates. Is this, would this project mitigate or stop that flow of water coming from north of Swan southbound and, and, and redirect it into these stormwater catches? So to some extent, uh, based on my understanding, what it does for sure is because parkland estates water always flows to the lowest area of course right. because parkland estates is at that lower elevation we're creating a system that will drain it via howard into bayshore effectively what that would mean is that water that flows down all the way from kennedy it, it, it more or less she flows down although we've got a system and some pond by horatio and swan and all of that right uh, that 
some of that activity will still happen. Water is still going to flow to the lowest spot. However, once it reaches parkland, it will, or once it reaches swan, it will enter a system that will drain it to the bay. So that Today, sounds like that, that sounds like the answer to that question is yes. This will mitigate yeah. that north-south flow that is so adversely impacting, especially that one area around the the park, Fountain Park, uh, that that is swampy and and, and definitely yes. is subjected to flooding. Now, my next my next thing is, I don't I won't vote for something that is going to affect Bristol. Um, so I, to me, that seems to be it has to be off the table, you know, because I'm very familiar with Bristol. I've I've been on Bristol many many times in my life, including recently. It is a uh, it's a street with historic significance. It's got that historic lantern in the middle of it in that little park that they have. The, the, the trees are amazing. And any work on Bristol is, is just just like I believe the Ar the city arborist has ruled out. Was it south of Lakeview because of the significance of those grand oaks that are along that street that they're not going to that they can't do that. So I think whatever you do has got to rule both that area south of Lakeview and Bristol. It's got to be completely off the table because as this moves forward, I just, I won't support that. Um, we have some land, you know, that, that whole triangle that, um, I can't remember what is it. I think it's Parkland. It's that little triangle where they dead ended that street and oh, around yeah. Swan. So there's a lot of land there that's, you know, that, that would be lower impact that we can utilize for whatever. And then moving along that commercial corridor, you know, Swan's a broad street, it's a wide street. And we have other alternative ways of getting around in that area because it's a grid system in that area. So I think it would be lower impact on the northern side of Swan for traffic mitigation as we close. So I highly encourage as we move forward, I know it's design build and I wanna to talk to the folks that are in Parkland Estates now and around Howard that this is design build and you just heard from the head of mobility that nothing is concrete, that there's going to be more citizen involvement as they move forward in, these pro in the progression of this project. And um, you heard my statement that I'll stand in opposition to anything that impacts that's those significant trees, those Grand Oaks and um, Bristol Avenue, and as we pursue other options. But the stormwater project is a very important project. Hopefully, we'll be able to find the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people, taking those points into account. Uh, I appreciate that. For my friends in New Suburb Beautiful, I've got all your emails about your roads. I, I don't mean, need to deminimize your road situation, but let me tell you, the roads in all over South Tampa are third world quality. It has been, the, this, this is 50, 60, 70 years in the making. We have, as a city, been negligent. We've ignored our infrastructure, and it's by time people stand up in the city and improve their roads and fix their potholes. Council Member Miranda. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Vic, for a grant of $10,061,435 is pretty substantial, and it's very difficult to get. So you guys must have done a fantastic job in attaining that. However, within that $10,061,435, what are we going to accomplish as a realistic individual that I think I am? How much of the flooding are we going to save plus the money that you're going to get from other sources? Because water does not roll north, it rolls always south, no matter where you're at. And certainly this is the blunt of it going somewhere else. So at one time it was pipes going somewhere, and then, but the problem is that the exit signs all around the Bay Shore, those pipes are 16 to 18 inches wide, maybe 20. I don't know. You drive by, you can see them when the tide is low. What does that mean, and how does the drainage, at what point of time of water falling down on these areas, 2 inches, 5 inches, 10 inches, does it solve the problem? Does it solve the problem for any hurricane like a 1, a 2, or 3? When you get to a 4 and 5, I don't think any solves the problem anywhere. And, and I want to be realistic with the public, what we're doing, how much we're going to save the neighborhood from watering, uh, flooding now in the water situation in that area. But I want to make sure that we don't say, oh, we can solve it at Hurricane 5. I don't believe we can, but I, I'm just saying that to find out. So I think when you go and you speak to the neighborhoods, it's got to be very important in my mind to tell them what amount of water is going to be consumed by the new projects that are going on. Because certainly when the tide's coming in and you have the wind blowing and the tide coming into the neighborhood, the wind blowing in the same direction, there's no water going to go out because the tide will be higher than the pipes are taking the water out. So you have a, a compression of, of value and of weight, and certainly the incoming tide is much greater than the water going out. So these are the things that I want to be explained to the neighborhood exactly 
what it can do and what it cannot do. And I, I, I stress this because I've also gotten the same emails and the same individuals that the other council members have gotten. And I don't want to say we're going to save you all the water, all the drainage. I want to be realistic and tell them the facts, and I know you'll do that. And that's why I'm asking to please, when you go out, to solve the problem up to what point? Thank Absolutely, you. and thank you, Councilman, because that's a very important point. And we did try and make it as clear as we could, and we'll continue to do so. We're designing for a five-year, 24-hour condition. And what it will do is make it significantly better, significant improvement from the situation today. But it, there's just not enough money in the world to design for a category three, four, or five level of storm uh, from, from just a value engineering standpoint. So I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, again, the, the flood mitigation, the flooding relief situation will be significantly better than it is today. Uh, but it won't be uh, without any impact in hurricanes and things like that. It's just it will drain much, much faster uh, and, and make uh, the area much more livable than it is today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Anybody else? What's the pleasure of council? Do you wish to move this resolution? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a motion from Council Member Miranda, yeah. second from Council Member Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Mr. Bede. Do you also have uh, item number 53? I see Brad, Brad Baird. Yeah, that might be Brad's item. Okay. Sorry. Mr. Baird, if you're online or anybody for 53? <coughs> yes, ma'am. I don't think we need him. Oh, okay. No, no, it's, it's just a, it because says it's... no, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just a 60... It's just a, such an extensive item. That's why it's on. Okay. The... May I have a motion to move that resolution? So moved. Sorry. We have a motion from Council Member Hertex, second <laughs> Council Member oh, Clendenin. But third, uh, 53 and 54 since they're companions. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll take them one at okay. a time. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Can I get a motion for 54? So moved. Motion Sorry. from Council Member Miranda, second from Council Member Clendenin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> All right. We've taken care of 55, 56. 57 and 58 and 59 are fire related. Councilmember Vieira. Yes, um, no, it's just for 57 and 58. So I saw the memos, I think, Chief Tripp, for the very uh, detailed memos. <clears throat> And there's some issues I want to discuss with TFR that don't really require the time of council, especially, I mean, at this time, uh, especially the cut through from Morris Bridge Road into uh, K Bar Ranch. You know, many different things have been talked about to help out K Bar Ranch with response times whether it's building a fire station, a modular station, a transport vehicle, which was mentioned uh, in the memo, a cut through Morris Bridge Road, whatever it is, if it's 20 Hill Marys, let's do 20 Hill Marys. Uh, I, I just want answers for that, as, as does uh, TFR and Local 754. Um, so th this requires some time to discuss some of these options proposed uh, by TFR. So if I may, I want to have these two items returned to us in let's say the final week of may that should give me enough time second let's take a look at some dates final week of may we have um we'll get now we have the we have a workshop on the 23rd the regular session is may 16th is that good for you yes sir that's very good thank you if all I right may. we have a motion from council member Vieira for uh these to come back May 16th under staff report. Second from Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And that's for 57 and 58. Correct? Yes, sir. And, and this will require some work with the county. Okay. Um, so, yeah. All right. Item number 59 regarding the reimbursement resolution. We have a memo from Mr. Michael Perry, but we also have a resolution. Do you have any? Uh, Mr. O'Hara is here. Yes, sir. <coughs> Good afternoon again, Council. Dennis Rojero, Chief Financial Officer. Uh, I am here mostly to answer any questions Council may have. This is the revised reimbursement resolution that Council requested confining this action to Fire Station 24 and the Fire Maintenance and Supply Facility. Any questions, Mr. Councilmember Rivera for Mr. Rojero? Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. And, and thank you very much, Mr. Rojero, for all your hard work in this. We, we really appreciate that. I wanted to make sure 
I, I did a motion to have these come back to us quarterly, right? I, I believe so. Okay, I did. Yeah, then, then I, I, I have nothing. Just um, thank you very much again for your hard work. This is uh, a really big step forward for Tampa Fire Rescue and, um, and something really wonderful. So, yeah, it'll be our um, third fire station if you include 25, which is medical only, since 2018. So that's uh, good stuff. Thank you. Would you like Thank to you, move sir. the resolution? So moved, if I may. Second. We have a motion from Council Member Vieira, second Council Member Hertek. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Yes, Thank you, Council. Um, while I have him here, can I just quickly get 62 done? Sure. Um, because this oh, involves yes, Mr. O'Hara as well. And I, I asked for, I did, I said that we didn't need anyone there, but just in but case. Here he is. Yes, and he's already <laughs> here. So basically, this was. Um, you mentioned his name three times when he appeared. Yes, <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> Uh, but basically, this is one of the things that we talked about during the budget cycle about having uh, the $2 million that we pay for people's credit card fees to pay their bills. And uh, Mr. O'Hara and his team have come up with such a great way um, to move forward with this as a percentage. He, he gave us all the background, which I'm sure everybody's looked at. So I just wanted to move ahead and say that I, would, I think we should move forward with the 2% that the city will, will use, um, that they themselves will administer? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's why I didn't think we need a lot of conversation, but no. just do you, do direction. That's a formal motion to just Yeah, I make a right? motion that we just go ahead and follow the Second. staff's suggestions okay. for the 2% um, fee. All right, we have a motion from Council Member Hertak, second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank All right. You. Thank you, Council. Looking forward to it. We Thanks will for proceed. your help with that. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank All right, you. we have um, item number 61. Ms. Feely has a PowerPoint that has been previously submitted. Oh, Mr. Herrera. Sir, oh, Mr. O'Hara. Oh, O'Hara. Yeah, we're going to need you back here to discuss the salary discussion. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. We'll do it at the end of the agenda. Yeah. Copy. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. I mean, Feely. <laughs> Good afternoon, Council. Abby Feely. Hello. Um, Deputy Administrator, Development and Growth Management for the city. This is a continued item on the e-board parking. Um, thank you very much. Just wanted, I know you heard under public comment this morning, um, some feedback and, and also um, in chambers this morning. I'm before you today to provide a staff report on any rec on recommended changes to improve the safety and security of parking lots. Um, in Ebor, specifically concerning the personnel requirements and an explanation of enforcement. With me today, I have Keith O'Connor, our Director of Code Enforcement. I have Captain Daniel College from Tampa Police Department, Susan Johnson Velez with the City Attorney's Office, also Kamaria Pettis Malkel, and Eric Cotton. We've all been working on this collectively together um, because. Uh, it's a big issue, and it, it's not just a land development issue. I think I've had an opportunity to speak with you all and, and share with you that while we can write land development codes, if we're not working together with TPD and code enforcement on a lot of these matters, um, we're not gaining any ground in, in bringing these, these lots um, up to our standards and then also the activity that is with the lots. So the last time I was um, before you, we had discussed um, many things, the physical conditions, the operational requirements of the lots. We were here September 28th, um, the last time, and we had had several, we had some operators here that were speaking um, about what was going on, them being informed. We had issued a letter um, to the operators letting them know that they needed to come into compliance, and we were, gave them a 60-day grace period to do that, and we began enforcement on October 1st. And Keith's going to give you an update on some of those numbers and what's been going on. We did hold two additional community meetings, one in Ebor, one at Hanna, um, to go through some of the concepts that we had talked about, because when we came on the 28th, we talked to you a little bit about changing the personnel requirement. Um, and making that either a licensed security officer. We had some language at that time that had come from um, the legal department on um, what that officer would be as licensed by the state of Florida. And from that time till now, I have had an opportunity, as was mentioned to you this morning, 
to look at the Orlando ordinance, which actually used our ordinance to draft their ordinance, um, but they had some different components to their code that we currently didn't have. And I'm gonna talk through some of those recommendations that were gleaned from um, their, current, their current regulations. So um, I just went over this, we were here, we did. We also, um, historic preservation, Alan Vila um, from Dennis's team and Keith, uh, some members of Keith's team went out, we did a windshield survey, we documented the lots that were out there whether or not they were in compliance. Um, that is how we generated uh, some of the enforcement that took place. Um, we also did a preliminary analysis of the YC5 and YC6 districts. These are the districts that allow principal parking by right as a permitted use. Um, currently, there are only six vacant parcels in those two districts. So one of the things that we kept hearing in the public, we don't want any more lots, right? Ebor is becoming more residential. We are seeing infill of houses. We want infill of houses. We don't want infill of lots. And um, so we looked at what would that mean if we said no more lots? Who would that impact if we took that, that use away? And it is right now only six vacant lots, which as you know in the district, it's very difficult to demolish a house without getting the approval uh, of the barrio um, to then become a parking lot. But, Really, we are continuing to try to look at where does our code fall short, what could we do? Um, so I have some more information on that as well, and then the concepts for your consideration. As I mentioned to you, it, this is a very multifaceted um, matter. Not only is it a land use matter, an enforcement matter, we're in one of five you know, landmark districts in the state. So we're trying to be very sensitive to how we're approaching this. And while it's taken some time, I just don't want to provide you with a haphazard, you know, recommendation that I don't think really is balanced in respect to um, the, vision, the vision for the district. So here's a map. This is based off of the inventory um, that we, we conducted, and you'll see the city's lots on here are shown in orange, HCC is yellow, the private lots are shown in blue, and then we have um, the private paid lots uh, shown in pink. So you can see predominantly that they're located, you know, along 5th, 6th, um, and 8th. I'm going to turn it over to Keith to give you an update on the enforcement, and then we will um, continue on. All righty. Thank you, Abby. Uh, Keith O'Connor, Director of Neighborhood Enhancement. Um, I'm going to go over an enforcement update that began in the fall. And just for clarification, since we have like two avenues going here, basically what the enforcement update is the existing code. There's a lot of talk about what the code may become, but obviously right now I can only enforce the code as it stands. So beginning in October 8th, there was a lot of talk about the lot attendance because that's one of the items that may get adjusted in the code change. So we started doing inspections for the lot attendance and um, starting in October 8th, we found, we brought eight cases to the special magistrate on December 5th. Of those eight cases, two were found to have no violation Two were found to have a violation with a $200 fine, and four were found in violation with a, with a $50 fine. So those fines were assessed, and since then, we have not found any more lot attendant violations since there. And we have been out inspecting the lots every weekend since November 1st. So um, just for clarification, when you hear a lot about that, as soon as they knew we were coming, that that seemed to take care of itself. In addition to that, we were doing bar inspections, about 50 bars each weekend for compliance with the rest of the code. Um, with TPD, with the fire marshal's office, we went out in a task force type situation doing that continually each weekend. Now that's gonna be tapering off now that we got through the holiday season and the parade seasons, but we still will be going out there, just not as intensely. Um, the daytime inspections, those inspections are ones for basically the rest of the code. Everything, whether it's part of historic preservation or the uh, other zoning code, we were going out there. And like Abby said, initially they did, we did a windshield um, view of all the lots. We found about 30 that had what we thought were violations. Um, 
And after once we started reviewing them, we realized that this was going to be a very labor intensive because we are basically checking every part of the lot to make sure it's in compliance. So we initially started it. And you'll see here that there was 24 cases opened, four cases were closed, and we're and now we're we've came up with another mini like task force where we are going through the code case by case. And it is labor intensive. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's not taking a long time, but it doesn't mean we're not doing it. We are doing it case by case by case. So we've had many meetings. Our next meeting, I think, is scheduled for next weekend where we're going to meet. They've already looked at all of these 30 lots, and we're going to come together as a team. Remember, it's zoning, it's historic preservation, it's code enforcement. Find out what the violations are and the remedy. I think I talked to Alan earlier today. He's already in contact with three of the main owners of the lots to get head, a head start on what they need to get their lots into compliance. A lot of it involves research. Some of these lots have been in place since the 80s. So when they were permitted to begin with, they've changed. So we're trying to get them back. So that's, that's an update on the enforcement for now. And like I said, I don't want anyone to think that I know it's a slow, pro slow process, but we are working towards getting these lots into compliance, which is the goal of code enforcement. Council Member Perkak. Just a quick question. Okay. So you mean, just to, because a lot of the neighbors are concerned, or the emails that we've gotten have been about, you know, it's still a dirt lot, it's still this, it's right. still that with the lighting. So this is what you're talking about when yes. you're talking about bringing them into compliance. And that it's, it looks like just from, and this I know is an, is an older, this was for January 25th, so things yeah. might have changed, but right now we have 20 open cases, if not more, where we're working through it with the owner of the lot. Correct. Yeah, I mean, there's at least 30 that okay. we can see have some, some type of violation. Okay. And then Thank we're going to come up with, with a plan to get to those. But like you said, they, it does take time. Okay. We started out, like, if, if we get a complaint on a one particular lot, the fence is down, we go out, okay, the fence is down, we write it up. We didn't check to make sure they had enough spaces or whether it was permitted 20 years ago for this many, we checked on the fence. So now we've been asked to check everything. So we had to kind of go back and we don't want to miss anything. And I know the, the neighborhood association is very involved and we're trying to get to it and it's become a long arduous process that is still ongoing. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that the public understood that. Thank okay. you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you very much, sir. You're yes, ma'am. And just, um, I also checked with my team, so anybody who is coming in for a permit or a formal determination, those go through the barrio. So it goes into Dennis's <coughs> shop, Dennis and Ron, um, and then all those lots get a certificate of appropriateness where they're checked to see if they're complying with the code. So if they did not have a permit and some of them did not, they either need to seek that permit or they need to seek a formal determination from Eric or they have to enter into another process. Um, we have four major operators and um, our team has actively been engaged with those four. Um, now, some still have not taken any formal action, but if the code enforcement action is running, just because they're coming in to speak to us, that's not going away. Those processes are, are continuing. As Keith said, the objective is compliance. Um, so concepts for consideration, I'll go through these. Um, this is just an overview of the ones that I'm going to present. Um, so we'll jump right in. The first one is um, parking off street principle. That's how those lots get created. Right now, You'll see in the yellow, they are permitted in those two districts, YC5 and YC6. That is a principal parking lot. The principal use of the property is parking. Um, and those there, that's where I mentioned to you, currently within those two districts, there are only six vacant parcels. So if you were to say, we're not going to allow that anymore, um, that would impact six. The other thing, the other point that was brought to you by Mr. Michelini a few weeks ago was it would make the existing uses non-conforming. It would, um, which was stated to be somewhat problematic from an insurance perspective. If that is the case, since that's been discussed, the other option on this would potentially be to make this a special use too, a conditional use that meets those criteria but is required a public hearing before this board. So that would be 
an alternative to that for those, and it would not make the existing ones non-conforming. It would make them a special use considered to be conforming if they are legitimate. Um, so they would not be a non-conforming use. They would be deemed um, conforming uh, in that case. The Uniform Personnel and License Security, I think this has um, been one of the largest parts of the conversation is that things changed personnel-wise, people don't pay by personnel, the, the purpose of personnel, what is the intent of personnel. Um, and we've had some very interesting discussions at the past two public meetings on this. So um, Orlando does require a uniformed private security officer. Um, and you could also have it be a licensed bonded security officer. In some of the earliest meetings, the discussion surrounded that this person needed to be visible from the public. If there was an attendant, the attendant was in their car, they're not visible, it's not providing that presence that we're looking at in the operation of the lots. Um, so our recommendation or consideration for you would be one of those two, to either use the licensed bonded security guard, it could say licensed bonded um, private security officer, licensed by the state of Florida, and located in a visible location on the property. Councilman Murphy. Thank you. Um, does a uniform, uniform private security officer, does that mean that the person does or does not carry a gun, or is that not? They would not okay. be required, and, no. And so this is what Orlando currently uses. So it is it is legal, the state of Florida, no one's had a problem with it. Okay. So, with I, so currently Orlando does the uniformed or the licensed, or do they allow the choice? I believe they use the second bullet, licensed, bonded, security okay. guard. And um, I have their ordinance excuse my, in my, my naivety. Uh, what, what is the difference between the two? I don't know that there okay. actually okay. is there a actually is one. Okay. Maybe, maybe one of the lawyers knows, but if not, that's fine. I'm just curious. Licensed and bonded. So. Yes, I, I know this, this has probably been asked and answered long, either before I was on a council or since I've been here and I just forgot. Um, how, does, how is this applied across the various types of parking lots? Like, you know, Columbia Restaurant, all these new restaurants have big, big parking lots. The city has big parking lots. Is this applied equally across a parking lots, a parking lots, a parking lot? Or is this just specifically to privately held parking lots? Like that are well, the Columbia lots. would be a privately held, well, but, but is it, it is not a paid lot. These are for lots that yeah, receive know. payment. Um, and the city of Tampa does provide that service. And right. as mentioned this morning, um, we provide above and beyond what we have our own operating standards. So we, are, we do have... Security. I do, I do recall that part of the conversation. I just yeah. didn't know about the unpaid parts of the parking lot, so I was just trying to think about consistency there. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, and ahead. and for the Orlando ordinance, just to clarify that, their their standards are for when a lot is providing parking after 10 p.m. So if you are providing parking after 10 p.m., these conditions apply to you. If you close at 5 p.m then you're not meeting that you don't have to then have that second layer of operational standards is that free for orlando is that free or not free I mean, it is if, paid, it, if, is they're paid, open, if they're open after 10 lots. p.m okay so even if they're open after 10 p.m if it's free that it doesn't apply correct okay thank you it's for payment after 10 p.m um, signage, this was one thing um, that came to our attention through discussions with the public. Right now, I have the current code requirements on there. Um, one thing we found during our windshield survey is many lots have excessive amounts of signage. Signage in the right-of-way, signage, I mean, 20 signs for one lot. So um, we have some recommendations related to, to signage. Um, we. Clearly, there should not be signs placed in the right-of-way adjacent to the parking lots. Um, it's impeding on the pedestrian way. It's a hazard. Um, we also discovered that many lots are missing, and it's not a requirement of our code, Section 1464, and that relates to public consumption of alcohol. It is supposed to say, it is supposed to have a sign that says, um, let me go ahead, just a few, 
that it is unlawful for any person to consume any form of alcoholic beverage on property upon which the owner has posted this sign. And then it says what that notice should be. So that was one thing we need to update our code that these signs need to be posted within. And we, we should have a set standard for what those signs within the lots would be. Um, but going back also, um, we should have hours of operation, towing information. Um, this, these sign requirements could be for non-paid lots as well. Um, when we started out, we were not looking at the non-paid lots. Um, and I, if it is the direction we travel in, that that's council's wish that the, these standards apply to any lot, um, I think we need to go back and analyze that. Getting all of this together was a very large undertaking, so I didn't want to just start expanding out into other areas. I wanted to try to finish this part for you first, and then we could go on to the next um, steps. So um, also, additional information, if, lots w if we require lots to physically close, and I'm going to talk about that coming up, then they would have a, a notification on there, if they're not in operation, who you would contact um, to potentially retrieve your car. The one thing I haven't mentioned, you know, a lot of this also looks at drinking and driving and people trying to get their cars out when you're, you're really just trying to secure the property in a way so loitering is not happening after the clubs have closed, it's 3 a.m., people are going now back to where they're parked and having an after party next to a residential property. So it's really balancing all of these different regulations um, together. So um, the, the other recommendation that's at the bottom of the slide related to the sign posting for the alcohol consum consumption is if we put this into Chapter 27, and it is in both 14 and 27, that gives both TPD and code enforcement the ability to enforce this. Unified buffer requirements. Um, right now, the code is kind of um, confusing. It has two different standards, one if you're below 7,500 square foot lot, one if you're above. Um, and also, it does require some landscaping with, 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 without irrigation. Um, doesn't seem to flourish very well in that area, becomes an eyesore, foot traffic is trampling on it. Um, so we are um, providing a consideration that we required a uniform buffer standard. Um, it would be three foot or four foot fences along the right of way that would be consistent with the district standards. And then interior lot lines would have a minimum of six foot or a maximum of eight foot fence. Um, and then when you're adjacent to residential, you would have to provide a five foot distance from that fence to the spaces. Um, right now, we do that. Um, it's a wall with 15 feet. And some of these are very small lots, so you would never get spaces at all. So we were trying to find a balance that would be um, provide that buffering, but also provide less maintenance on the lot where it, it's being maintained and not, not an eyesore. So um, all fencing would be required to meet the site visibility. And then if alternatives were requested, those would go through Dennis Fernandez um, for consideration to be consistent with the district. The annual operations and security plan, this would be a new requirement. This is what Orlando does use. Each year, the operator comes in and says, I intend to operate this lot this year, and here is how I am meeting your code. Um, and it goes through. And you'll hear me say a lot of times, I don't like to put operational standards into land development regulations, because right there, land development regulations regulate land. They shouldn't regulate operation. But this would provide a mechanism, a plan that is required to be submitted um, to development coordination, or it would actually go through Dennis each year, uh, to show, here is my lot. I intend to operate it as a lot during those 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. hours. Here's how I'm meeting security. Here's how I am in compliance with your buffering, your sign requirements. Um, here's the contact information. Here's my hours of operation. And then um, it would go from there. 
and that is not intended to be burdensome or it would and if you're doing it year after year you would simply provide an affidavit that you are continuing to operate in the same way that you are op that you filed the year before so I think we could work that out in a more meaningful way that puts us on notice of the <coughs> operator's intent and gives us that annual check of compliance. I mean, that's the same as going on SunBiz and registering a business. You know, every year you have an annual report or City of Tampa business license every year. I mean, I think it's, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm looking at both sides. Like, what could be comp complicated? You're operating. You have a site plan. If nothing changes, you can keep submitting the same one every year, right? Okay. Commitment to provide security. You have a contract with a security uh, company. Basic information, hours of operation, and then signage, which we talked about, you know, decluttering the, instead of 20 signs on a property, just saying, this is who you report, this is the towing. I mean, I don't, I think that's fair. I don't think it's burdensome. Yes, sir. Signage. And Actually, and also the uh, the entrances and exits. There seems to be a lot of these parking lots that have, within just a few feet of each other, multiple entrances and exits. So even if you restrict signage, you have duplication of you know signage here and ten feet later signage there. So we have these you know multiple entrances to the same piece of which is kind of odd to me. I do the signage clutter is just absolutely crazy. Don't doesn't our current code restrict that? I mean, couldn't we be maybe this is a code enforcement issue? that shouldn't we be able to enforce the signage problem that we have right now? I mean, I see signs that are way too big because I believe we have sign limits, size, size limits. I see, again, multiple signage on, on the lots. I'm just, it's just crazy what I'm seeing on some of these properties. I mean, isn't that, do we actually need code or we just need enforcement? Well, on the missing sign, the one related to right. the alcohol, alcohol we right. do need yeah. to change the code for that. But we could be, that could be included on like, Correct. One general information sign and have that included, right? Correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. We could say each lot shall contain one sign with this information. This is where you pay. This is how you, yep. this is if you get towed. This is where you go. You know, yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. And I can um, let Keith speak, but I believe, I believe we could enforce today. Well, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> Keith may tell you otherwise. Well, if you're talking about signs that advertise that, you know, this is Acme parking lot, that sign would have limitations in the code on how big it can be and everything right. else. If you're talking about you only allowed three exit signs per exit or whatever, that I don't know if it's written in the code that way and that's specific, but if it's written in there and, it, and there's a rule, then we can enforce it. You'll look, look into that. And also, and also, again, maybe as we draft this about what these parking lots are supposed to look like, how many entrances and exits and you know that's a flow of traffic and how traffic's come in and traffic coming out and I think that might be worthy of looking at as well because I see a couple examples that are kind of like haphazard. I think one of the biggest challenges we've found is they received a permit maybe it was for 10 spaces in a certain configuration and today it's now 22 spaces in a completely different configuration and that's part of the enforcement that we've been handling it's like your BLC permit was for this. Your options are to return to this or to come and get a new permit to become this. So we, that, that is one of the biggest challenges we are facing in bringing all of this back into compliance. This is so. why staff cringes when Pandora's box is opened because you never know what's going to fly out of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Um, implications and next steps. Um, you know, if we proceed with removing the principal, par at principal parking as a permitted use, it would, we talked about this, make the lots non-conforming. They could continue operation. But if we went to the special use route, I think that would negate some of the insurance issues that have been raised by some of the operators, but still allow for lots to be elevated to a different level. They're not permitted anymore. They're conditional uses. They have a set of standards, and they're required a public hearing before this board. Just, just a quick question. Would the parking lots that are currently permit, uh, permitted under 5 and 6 be allowed to be moved into SU2, or would they all have to come in front of us? 
So there is a condition, there is a provision in the code that is called special uses considered not to be non-conforming. It should be that they're considered to be conforming, but it's an old provision. But it's like um, places of religious assembly used to be a permitted, you, you know, now there are special use. But if you were a church before that, you are, you're legit. Okay. That's um, but then if there are conditions, if you expand, if you cease operation, if you, there's, I could bring those back to you when we bring, if, if we go in this direction, bring back the special use and show you what those are. Okay. So if you expand by a certain amount, if you cease operation for a period of 180 days, then yes, you would have to come back. And basically you would say, I lost my lot because I was not, and now I want to reestablish under the special use. It wouldn't be completely taken away, but it would come before this board um, for your consideration. This council. Yes, sir, council member. I hate to talk so much, but so special use, it, you know, I know we're talking just about Ybor City, but for the city as a whole, um, is that is special use as a designation we could use for um, the expansion of parking like uh, for anywhere else? So that, let's say that, okay, now we come to a, we come to a, a full stop now on service parking expansion and then people have to apply for special use to be able to, if they wanted to start a parking lot? So in different areas of the city, it's different regulations. Okay. But I'm gonna, we're getting we can, ready we, to kick we, off the we, code we, reform. We can, we, can <laughs> we can defer to a private conversation yes. about that. Just yeah, well, we're getting ready to kick off the code reform okay. where we're gonna get an analysis of our code because it's been there since 87, you know, right. and um, I think we have priorities within those discussions, such as housing affordability, such as, and if that is one of that, I think we could come back with something through that process. Thank you. Uh huh. Um, one thing I have been working with Susan and Kamaria on is if we put these new standards in, you are not, as a lot, you're not vested. If we put in an, an annual operating plan, if you've had a lot for 20 years, there would be language in the code that says, as of July 1 of 2024, all existing lots are subject to the following. And that is where we bring everybody into this new set of regulations. And you would present this at the February 22nd workshop to give private property owners the opportunity to speak should they come? We would put this into the January cycle, is that right? Which will be in February. So like we come to you with those amendments, then we go and do the public information workshop, then we do what we do. We would, the January cycle is just starting running, so if we wanted to do that, we could put it into that, and then it would go like a regular text amendment and have those same meetings, and it wouldn't be for a little while till it got adopted, but um, it would, July 1st would be the target effective date. Okay, Council Member Hurtag. Thank you. So, sort of, it's like what, what the Planning Commission came back with us before. We're giving you the blessing to get started on this, but there's still, pub there's still public workshop. There's still, there's still a lot before. So, anything we decide today is not set in stone yet. We are just telling you the direction in which we would like you to go. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Anything else in your presentation? That is it. So, would you like a motion from council if uh, Oops. To, to give you direction? Yes, please. Yes. <laughs> no, no, because no, Council Member Hurtak had her hand up. Yes, sir, Mr. Yeah. Shelby. Uh, I'm sorry, just a question with regard to the date. Did you say uh, the 22nd of February? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. That's the workshop. So yes. right now, February 22nd is the workshop that has the January text amendments on there. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to have whatever yes. information uploaded? We've drafted, we've drafted the ordinance already. It was our team's discussion that putting the language out there before we had this conversation with you to get that, even though we could have and we really want to be um, responsive to the neighborhood and, and the, the stakeholders of this matter, but we wanted to have today. We pulled back on that, but we, we do have it drafted, yes. Thank you. It, we have the bones put together. We, were, we needed some direction from today, but we'll be able to get it put together. So I would like to say that personally, I, I think the SU2 version is the way to go because then it does protect the current lot owners, but it doesn't 
but it also encourages moving forward with those lots if people wish to do something different with them. Um, the only other big difference for me, I like everything in here. Um, I don't have a, again, I, I'm going to have to, I guess we'll just have to figure out the legal difference between a, the we two types of security we, guards. Yep, we can and work then on that. I do believe that these standards should apply to all lots because I find that the two lot thing is confusing for people. I mean, it's either a lot or it's not a lot. I mean, you're either going to be open after 10 or you aren't. So I think, I think that we need to have some consistency there. Hmm. Okay. Council Member Clendenin? Yeah, sorry. I, was, I swear to God I wasn't going to talk again, but here I am. Um, I, I, my, my gut tells me the same thing. I would like consistency because, you know, again, equal protection, you know, a lot's a lot's a lot. And it just makes sense to me that, that, that if we're in forest confusion, that we have, we have one standard. I mean, honestly, I'd like to have one standard across the entire city and not just specific for one region, area. So as we look forward to what you're talking about for future conversations, I really appreciate the fact that you're continuing to work with both the neighborhood and the, the property owners to make sure because everybody's, everybody's got an interest in this. And I think it's important that we do that. Um, but I do believe some of this com these compliance issues with signage and entrances and you know, I think we have to get that in, in, in line with where we want as far as the direction of the city. But I appreciate the work that staff has done this. I know this has been burdensome. Uh, it's sensitive, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult with the community. So I really appreciate what you, what you and everybody else has done as part of this. So, I mean, I'd like to say, I don't know what you want as far as, as other than just a go forward and conquer. Um, and you just, you've heard the comments, but I'd say, you know, go forward and move forward with this and bring us back a document and let us vote on that document. So let me just ask on the non-paid versus paid. Um, you want the physical standards to be the same, fencing, buffering, signage, but not the security aspect. That's only for those lots that are operating after 10 p.m. and taking payment. Because you, I mean, if the Columbia restaurant closes at 11, for example, their lot really shouldn't I mean isn't being used they have accessory parking you know there's different types of parking when parking is adjacent directly to then it's not principal parking principal parking is when the lot is only parking and it's not associated with any other use it is providing parking uh, I kind of like to hear the sentiment of other council members on this yeah, yeah. gentlemen Anybody? I, I just, you know, I'm listening to the presentation and I want to be supportive of, of staff and all the hard work that you've done. I understand it. Um, the the um, private parking like the Columbia um, requiring that they have the same signage, I think is reasonable so it won't be confusing. That's my only thing. Okay. All right. Anybody else? <laughs> No, no. Let's go back. I no, think, wait, wait. I think, Council Member Miranda, we'll go back. I think when it comes to guards. Okay. <laughs> oh, respect, I'm sorry. Respect his authority. No, no, no. No, ready right. first. Go on. It was a typo. No, it's, it's, it was a typo. Go on. Uh, so I would just say that, that it's something that, that should have a, a deeper conversation. Initially, if they close at 11, I think they close at 12. So that would be a two hour thing because the issue is, are people parking? I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not down there that often at two in the morning. Are people parking on those lots anyway? Even when there aren't people there? I think that's the bigger issue for us is, is someone using that parking lot after midnight? Because I don't think they have gates on that parking lot. Well, so. I so, just realized I did not cover that part. I think I, I went through it. That is one of the things that Orlando does require when when you're done operating the lot, the lot's done. You you close it. You physically place, and and we're having that conversation with Dennis because it needs to be historically appropriate, right? If it's a piece, if it's a wood picket fence that's out there, when the lot closes, they should probably have a section of fence that they then reattach, and it is physically closed, so you cannot enter the lot once the lot's hours of operation have ceased. Um, same thing, if your car happens to be in there, 
then you need to contact them and when the lot reopens tomorrow or whatever it is, you get it versus sending wreckers at 3.30 in the morning next to a house to be removing the cars. So that is one aspect in, in us discussing this that I was like, oh, I missed that in my presentation. Pandora's so, box. Yes. But, so it's, I it's think hard. That, yeah, it is. So I think that we should go forward with standards applying to all lots, but maybe doing something like if your lot closes by 12. Yeah. But so from 10 to 4, but if your lot closes at 12, then maybe you only need a, I, I don't know. Uh, I, would, I would take that back to both the lots and the neighborhood and see what they think um, because they're the ones that are impacted by it. Councilmember Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. From what I heard, the Columbia does not charge, right? No, no. correct. They, they do not. They have, they have <laughs> That's a big lot in front of the of 7th Avenue on the north side. They have the lot south of them that goes to the next block. That's shared between themselves and uh, the, the restaurant uh, mm -hmm. across the street that they own both of them. So how are they going to come out of this if we're going to post? They don't charge anything. So they're going to have to have a watchman there or yeah, do no, something to do. Uh, it's tough. Yeah. I didn't hear that. What's going to happen to the Columbia on this deal there, sir? They're a parking lot for themselves without charge. No charge. And see. How, how are they going to get treated? The same way? Well, that's why I was handling the paid lots first, because that's the code currently has standards that are attached to the paid lots, and we hadn't moved on to the non-paid lots yet. Although some of the message coming from the offers was if you're going to require this of a paid lot, you should require it of a non-paid lot also, and I'm hearing that, but I have not thought through what that non-paid situation would be yet. That's why I asked, is it the physical part of it? You want it to be buffered, you want it to have fencing, you want it to have other things, or is it both the physical and operational? And I just brought the Columbia up because I know they don't charge. However, the two lots of the big ones, the front and the back, those are rarely because all those have paving. Yep. I don't know about the one on the east side. Most of that is paved, but that's an alleyway or something that they have the rights to and so forth and so on. So I'm not here to defend anyone, but I want to make sure <coughs> that there's a difference between paid and non-paid. There's got to be. Uh, if not, what are we here for? So what's the pleasure of council? Are you good? Have you received enough feedback? <laughs> would you like to talk again? Do you need a motion for? Um, for I, I would like to move forward with the paid standards at this time for that I next make, cycle. I make a motion to ask staff to move forward on paid standards and we can revisit this. Because one of the other things I would like to, re, uh, to talk about is how, how we, through our code, incentivize development on this, on this parking. So, you know, if we could do bonuses and things that we could do to incentivize uh, owners of these surface parking lots. To, for development in their properties and do, do what we can do. So I think that's all for future discussion. I would say at this point, I would motion for, con for this council to approve staff move forward on paid um, parking lots and the others to be continued. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second from council member Hertek and Mr. Shelton. And does this include adding something to the, the 22nd of February workshop? Mm -hmm. It's not already set it's not, or it's included in this. It's, it's included in this. <clears throat> Eric on development coordination. Um, staff is bringing on the 22nd for the January cycle. And this so, is included in that. So there's information already that has, I think, been forwarded to council. The memo has been signed and such. This would be an, addi an addendum to that because that was not part of that original so it wasn't. Mm -hmm. agenda. So we can add that in. Yeah. That shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Is that part of the motion then? Is that all right? We, do, we don't really need a motion. Well, they just so need... it is said, so it is written. Yeah. <laughs> we have a motion <laughs> just, for, just for clarity's sake from council member Pundenis and council member Hurtak. And then what I would suggest, just so we don't lose sight of it, is that for the next cycle, for the July cycle, we start considering the rest of the lots. Because I just don't want that to be um, forgotten. And I also, because I know it's a bone of contention in, with some of the owners and the neighborhood too. So let's, let's say that we're going to try to get that for the July cycle. Is that fair? Yes, I just, okay. like I did say, the code reform is also going to kick off. So yeah. at some time, I want us really, because you're going to be part of that, to collectively focus on working on that reform with Eric and I and not have parallel traveling paths of text amendments because our goal is to have 
a cohesive update to the plan to the code. Yeah. So yes, yes, I I will not let it go, and I know my partners in this will not let it go either. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank Anything you, else, Council. Ms. Feely? No, sir. Thank so you. So it has come to my attention that your daughter will be hearing from Florida State today to see if she got in. It is decision day. And we want to wish her the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. My wife is getting her master's through Florida State as we speak, so, you know, very supportive of it, and just a, a shout out to her, and best of luck, and hopefully it's good news. I, I will always do this, but I'll do this for her today. Well, her number one choice is UF, oh, okay, um, but so. that's not till next Friday, but I, I'm a Noel, so okay. she's, yes, but we're very excited. She's waiting for me to come home now to go click the button, so thank you very much. Thank you, know, you very much. And just so I can add this, you should pick up the book, where you go is not who you will be. Um, you should pick that up for her to read. It has some really, really good stories in there about college admission or not getting in or getting in. Thank you. I appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. We come to item 63 and 64. I, I, I uh, all right, Mr. Uh, Massey, you're here for 63? 63 and 64. Yes. All right. Go ahead, sir. Uh, real quickly, I heard some discussion this morning where you're going through the agenda, Morris Massey Legal Department. There's one memo that addresses both these items. 63 deals with the development agreement uh, for the Tampa Heights Riverfront project. Um, we're in discussions with the developer. Um, we're bring, we'll be bringing forth an amendment to that development agreement where part of that, and we're, I've been through this with him already, he's going to be providing information that he should have provided already on what's been built relative to compliance with the EBO. And then we're also building into it uh, annual reporting requirements for everything under the development agreement that's somewhat consistent with the ordinance that I'm proposing or we're proposing under 64. And 64 is the draft ordinance that would require any developer who enters into a Chapter 163 development agreement with the City of Tampa be required to annually file a monitoring report with the city staff regarding compliance with all the commitments in that development agreement. <laughs> And if you all find what was drafted favorable, I would appreciate a motion to, uh, to direct staff to move that forward to the Planning Commission for review and then back to you all for uh, then uh, consideration and possible adoption. So. Council Member uh, Henderson then. Yes, I do have a motion for it. First, um, Attorney Massey, thank you so much for all of your hard work in this matter. I really appreciate it. Um, it was my first big, big, big motion um, that was supported by um, Councilman Vieira and her tech. So, I would like to make a motion for item number 64. I move that a draft ordinance providing for an updated notice process and annual reporting requirements for development agreements adopted pursuant the Chapter 163 Florida statute be forwarded to the Planning Commission for review and then scheduled for consideration at, um, and adoption by City Council. We have a motion from Council Member uh, Henderson. Do we have a second? Second, Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. And that that takes care of both items, Mr. Massey? Both fine. Yeah. yeah. 63 and 64. 63 and 64. Yes, that is, yeah. Mr. Okay. Mr. Shelby. Yes. That concludes the agenda. That's however, a, really however, nice. we still have to talk about the salaries. Yes, that's at the bottom. We still that's, have to talk on about. on the agenda. Actually, officially. That's, that's agenda. That officially, that was added to the agenda mm -hmm. during the approval. Yes. It sure yes, was. Yes. So, uh, let's discuss salaries here. Thank you. Council Member Henderson. Well, can, um, yes, I actually made that motion, and it not only involved the advisory committee looking at making recommendations, it also asked um, our CFO to look at any funds um, left over from last fiscal year, and um, it's just important that we address this topic. I know that, thank you, there you are. You were going to appear like that, okay. <laughs> um, I know that it was during the election cycle before I became a council member, the reason um, the mayor presented for a, a raise uh, for city council and it was politicized. So that's why you didn't want to vote on it. And so, is that, why is that echoing? What's going on? What is that? Oh, we just can't, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so um, it was politicized and so I know that council, um, you know, did not want to move forward with the raise. That was, I think it was a 43 vote for that, not not getting the raise that was about $70,000, which was I think about 40%, I'm not sure remembering the percentage. 
But now we are here, this is a new council, we're not even one year in, and I just think it's important that we address this, not from the standpoint of just us, but talking about how this council, the body of this council looks moving forward uh, now that I am in this position. I can clearly see the amount of work that it takes to put, um, that, that goes into it. Um, <clears throat> my overachiever personality is not necessarily that of what I expect other people to do that serve in a position like this. And so for me, um, the average salary for uh, a citizen in the city of Tampa it runs about 60 plus thousand dollars. And I do see a reasonableness in raising our salary by May 1st, which is our anniversary, one year anniversary, by 15%. And I'm asking you as our chief financial officer to look at that cost. I equated it to about $20,000 if we were to vote on that, what it would cost us right now um, to receive those funds. Um, as of May 1st through the end of our fiscal year, how much that would cost, I kind of calculated about $25,000. And then having a 15% raise, um, you know, put into the budget for the coming year. So I know that, um, you know, some members don't support that, but we have to look at it beyond just us right now, the reasonableness of bringing it to an average salary I think is something that will provide an interest um, to community members who are interested in politics but cannot afford to sit on a body like this because of the income. And I just really believe that if you look at, I, it doesn't take a study. If you look at the body of who has sat on council over the past 50 years in the city of Tampa, you, you don't see, I, I am not typical. A single parent is not the typical city council member. Uh, I'm the 16th woman, the 16th woman in the history. So that makes her take the 15th woman in the history. And that in itself just defines that this position, um, we need to look at the income level so that we can attract a more population of people that may be interested in politics. And I am going to you know, pursue that. I, of course, I want to hear Councilmember Hertek's comments and other members before we move on, but we have to have this discussion as to um, you know, whether you're for or against it and let the public hear it. But I do believe that 15% is about an $8,000 raise uh, based on the $54,600 that we make right now, um, which is, <laughs> Um, you know, not of average medium income. So yes, that was going to be my question to you. So you want to raise it to the average median income for At this? Least, okay. Well, okay. but you know, no. we had a public comment today. Let me turn back on my microphone. We did have a public comment um, today by one of our advisory board members, and um, her numbers were really kind of fall in sync with what I can agree with, and that is. Uh, did you put it on the screen for us? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, can you cut on that overhead? It's not um, a public hearing. Yeah, oh, she just said it on the screen. I just it was for a visual. I think it was hers fell about sixty three thousand um, dollars. I believe that's what it was. So that might be a little. That may be between well, fifteen and eighteen percent. Um, well, um, so when when uh, chief of staff did his review of all the people it was, around, it was seventy five. It, it was seventy five, but, and uh, but so I don't think that that would get the support of this. Body. I agree, but I do agree with you that it should be this body's goal to take it there by the end of our term because of exactly what you said. I'm the fifteenth woman that has sat in this seat. She is the sixteenth woman that has sat in this seat. And I don't know, what number are you? 300. Hey, I'm the no, first one. I know, but, that they, <laughs> but, but you're, the, you're the last oh, wait, male. No. You're the, I, I apologize. You're the, you're the last male. Do you know what number you are? I have no idea. So I, it's got to be in the 300s. It's in the 300s. It's in the 300s. And so, but, but that's not my only issue. Mm -hmm. It's, as school teachers, you are serving your final year, but if you were in the middle of your career, you couldn't do this. Correct. You could not take this off. The only people who are able to do this are people who, are, who own their own businesses. Or they're rich. 
or they're wealthy enough to do it. Yeah. But generally speaking, those of us um, who are on here, we own our own businesses. I took a serious pay cut to do this, and I question that on a monthly basis. But um, I still love my job. But I, it's it's hard um, to to cut your salary so much. Um, but I I want to see more women in this role. I want to see more young people in this role. I want to see. I, I just want to. When the next election cycle comes around, I just want to see a lot of different folk who don't normally get a chance to do this. Uh, I think this is a really exciting thing. The city is growing. So honestly, even if you look at it by per capita, mm -hmm. it, it's got to be more. Um, I do not understand why people don't support this. I, this, this to me is something I don't, I don't know why people don't. It's, it's not really our self-interest as much as it is going forward and making sure that people who come after us have it better than we do. Council Member Vieira, Council Member Miranda, Council Member Condetta. Thank you very much. And, and I've always been very clear in my position, which is um, I, I don't support for myself giving myself um, a pay increase above inflation for this year uh, before an election. Uh, if we're talking about the next city council and uh, people that will come after us, I'm not just open to that. I'm supportive of the idea. you got to obviously look at the specifics, but I am supportive of that uh, for future councils. Uh, for myself, I, I don't support uh, something that is above um, inflation uh, year by year. Um, I, I just don't. I tried to have a, uh, an ordinance. Uh, that would have mandated that much like the 27th Amendment. And, and by the way, I, I, I do want to say this because uh, uh, Councilwoman Henderson mentioned this, that this issue was unfortunately politicized. And that's a shame. Uh, th that's, a, that's a real shame. Uh, so again, when I make my comments, it's not pointing fingers at anybody. It's not setting something up for some future ad or something obnoxious like that. It's just my principle that I've always stuck to. I think that those, uh, again, beyond an inflation adjustment, uh, uh, at before an election or after an election, you ought to wait till the next election. Um, so if this is brought back, let's say in 26 for entering council members in 27, I, I think that's very reasonable and that's something that I think people in Tampa can support and I certainly can support that. So on, on the principle of future councils and bringing in more people, very supportive. But for us right now, I, I respectfully cannot support that. Council member uh, Miranda, then council member. I'm just gonna talk that uh, A, Whatever politicized mean doesn't bother me one bit. Your microphone. Uh, it doesn't bother me one bit, whatever the word politicized means. Uh, and I've got a salary here from 1974 through now. And uh, however, there was rumored that some council members, and I don't know who don't care to know, wanted 60% of the mayor's salary to be the council salary. That's totally out of range. When you did a study, I didn't do the study, somebody did a study and it showed that St. Pete, Orlando, Tampa, and Miami had their salaries. If my mind serves me correct, because the mind's 83 years old, the body is old, but the mind is real sharp in this case. It was within two or three thousand dollars of each city's raises. Salary, I should say, not raises. So I'm not opposed to a raise. I'm opposed to getting a raise higher than the inflation rate or higher than the general general employees not department heads then the salary we are got elected to serve the general employees and the public of the city of tampa the public of the city of tampa does not get a 10 15 20 percent raise ever that i know of those are the guys and ladies that are working their butts off so that they can feed their kids so i am not going to vote for a 60 percent raise i can tell you that 1974 the annual salary of the council was $9,600 a year. I can also tell you that in that board there, there was about four or five of us that had just daily jobs. There were one or two that were professional or business owners. I can tell you that the other council members that I served with, at least half of them were just like you and I. They didn't have anything but a regular job and their wife or in other cases, the husband also worked. So let me go down the chain so we understand where we're at. From 96, I mean from 74 and 81, it changed to 14,000. It stayed 14,000, 81 through 83. 87, it went to 18. 88, you got a little raise, 19,928. 
In 19, it went down, adjusted monthly in 2000, and uh, 1993 it went down, and 2093 it went up uh, about $400 from 19,000 to 9928, and 2000, and, excuse me, 1995 it went to 25, two, 1999 it went to 2750, it went up to 26,520 in 2021, 27,316, 60. In 2002, 28,121, so it has been going up just like the employment did for all the general employees in the city. So we were not status quo. 2003, 28,974, and 2004, 29,848. So it went up again a little over $1,200. In 2005, $30,740.40. And in 2006, $31,657.60. And 2007, 40,248. So it has been going up according to the inflation rate or the general employees. However, from 2008, there was no increase for council and no increase on council until 2014. And you know why? because we were in a recession. We had to let go 758 employees. The Oreo administration never had time to do things she wanted to do, and she did take care of the city by doing things she had to do. And there's a vast difference when you do in anybody's work table that you want to do something and you can't do it, and you have to retract on what you want to do, change your mode, and make sure you save the city. And that's exactly what she did. In 2014, Salary went from 41246 to 2014 to $42,078.40, $40, $2015, $43,139. So there has been incremental increases, and I'm about finished. In 2016, $43,576, 2017, $44,886, 2018, $46,238, 2019, 47,632, and 2020, 49,000, 21, 50,544, 22, 52,062 dollars. So there has been increases on council salary. Problem is, we don't want to recognize what was done with the study of St. Pete, Orlando, Miami, and so forth. And I uh, can question me all you want, but here's a record if you want it. I don't know what the salaries are now in Orlando. I know the mayor's in a heap of trouble in, in, in Miami. Count, uh, council Member Clendenin. Yeah, um, <laughs> interesting. One, I believe John Bennett, our chief of staff, did a salary study. Um, and that salary study did take into account not just those three other areas. I look at this a little differently. Um, and, I, and I respect my two councilmen at the, at the end of the day as, of, uh, on their opinions on this. But I, I come at it from a different perspective. I think in our, in our, in our society, we, we pay people um, for various reasons, you know, you know actors and Football players get paid a ridiculous amount of money because of the income that they bring in and what they generate. Um, other folks, including our, our wonderful city employees, because of the, the, the work that they do every day and, and, and the service that they provide to the city, we compensate. Um, I, I'd like to highlight a couple of things. One, somebody remind me, how much do our, our, our assistants make? Um, $95,000. Uh, so the, the folks, that the, our assistants that work for us make $95,000 a year. Uh, or more, um, or more, um, because they've gotten incremental raises as well. That was like the, the floor. So um, we've, I, I'm, I'm of the oak again, you, you compensate based on either, you know, what income you're bringing in or the work that's being performed. It's very clear to me since I've gotten on to this council that we are, that this, and, and I won't speak to, you know, some other folks, but um, I feel bad for folks, especially someone who, if someone is try, is has given up income. I I'm I'm in a in a good position because you know I had a retirement and so I'm not I'm not suffering and I didn't have to sacrifice to do this, but other folks have and 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 other folks will people that will follow me on council, and you know it's it, again you compensate people for what they do. This is not a part time job, and if you're doing it well, it's not a full time job. It's a full time and a half job. Um, it's just as recent as this past week. You saw, we started at nine o'clock in the morning. We had a break in the afternoon, but we went to three forty-five. 
I, I went to sleep at five o'clock in the morning, woke up at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, the, and what y'all see on TV or what you see when you come to council chambers is just a small piece of what happens because there are volumes. I haven't read this much information since I was in college. I mean, I read everything. I read the contracts. I go through 200 page contracts. I don't, now I don't read every word of them, but I go through them to you know, just see if anything jumps out at me. But there's volumes and volumes of reading. So what do we do as a city? Do you, do you, uh, you know, we're not football players. We're not selling TV time, although I think after the last couple of weeks, we probably could. I think we should look for revenue enhancement by selling city council advertisement uh, for on YouTube, <laughs> on YouTube. But, um, oh wait, there I go, being funny again. I can't do that anymore. Um, so, I, and I appreciate the fact that one of my council persons talked about the next council, but you know, this is also a courage thing. We're called for every day to make the decisions, not based on any other reason of whether it is the right decision. And if it's the right decision tomorrow, it's the same right decision today. And while I appreciate you know, somebody's own individual principles, I'll be honest with you, I would look at somebody and say, you know what, I wouldn't support it if somebody doesn't want to say, is it right or wrong? Is this the appropriate compensation for the work that's being performed for the citizens of Tampa? If it is the appropriate compensation for the work for the, that is being performed, then let's, let's, let's say then, hell yeah, let's do it. Or if you can make an argument that says, no, the existing compensation is the, is the right compensation for the work that's being performed, then let's go with that. But I, I mean, I think that is the discussion to be made. What is the appropriate compensation for the actual work that's being performed? Mm -hmm. I also think statistics are statistics. I don't like to do, you know, grabbing at something that's imaginary. There was a study done by the chief of staff. It's concrete, it's factual, it's statistics. I, I would actually disagree with the maker of this motion. I don't think we should compromise from that. I think that we should accept the staff's recommendation, go forward with that. All of that being said, there's an empty chair to my right. I think this is a substantive conversation and I think it, it behooves us to, to not make this decision without everyone present. So I would move to continue this discussion to March 7th, 2024 Second. for a complete council and have this as the number one in our old business. Mr. Yeah. Shelby, uh, okay, we have a motion second. I haven't spoken. Yes. Well, before you do that though, if I can, I just sure. want you to know that I have been in touch with the clerk's office and I have been told that um, March 7th is full. quite, quite full. That's great. What's, what's the next not full date? It would be 14 days after. No, <laughs> no 20, see, that's right. A, a full day is a 16 20, hour day. 27? Is, is, is it a 16 hour day? And they get their way one way or another, 2027. Is, is the clerk saying it's a 16 hour day? Well, it's. 28? It's probably. probably it, I mean, 28th is fine. I mean, honestly, so I would I would motion that we continue this discussion on March 28th because it, it's, it, it'll be fine. And where do you Yeah, I do want to hear from. Um, I, would, I, would, I would have this number one on our agenda. Uh, uh, number Thank one you. on our agenda. I would so like to hear so that we don't, well. we don't kick this. And I think. The 28th? On the 28th. When you say number one on the agenda, do you mean before all public business and staff reports? Staff reports. After administration update. Yeah, after. Yeah. I understand. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. I just want to make my comments. So I started here. 2015 and I'm glad council member brought up council member Miranda brought up the uh, the salary chart because when I started here it was about forty three thousand dollars and my uh, and last year's what fifty two fifty three thousand dollars so I've seen an increase of let's say eleven grand over eight years um, I've been up since 1 30 this morning and you want to know what what I was dreaming about as I woke up I was dreaming about a bunch of trash in the middle of the road and somebody uh -huh. saying can you call solid ways to do a special pickup? This is what I'm dreaming about. I'm dreaming about work. And in my dream, I'm going, I got to get a hold of Lisa. And I wake up. And that's my, and I've been up since in anticipation for today's meeting. Um, Sunday mornings, I go to church. I get phone calls at 9 o'clock. People know that I go because I've said it. I go to the early mass. 9 o'clock, they call me. Oh, wait, there's a call code enforcement. I'll get calls at 11 o'clock at night. I get texts. You know, hey, what do I do with this? You know, and my wife tells me, she goes, don't answer it. But I answer because 
I'm elected to serve. I'm not perfect, but I want to be responsive. She goes, you're off the clock. You know, people work nine to five, but this isn't a nine to five job. Uh, we were here till, till almost four in the morning the other day. I got home, I think I slept 45 minutes, and I had to get up at 6.30 to take my youngest stepdaughter to school. And I was back here, I walk in, and the security guard goes, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And the, and the Citizens Budget Board is meeting, and you know, and Mr. Shelby is here, I don't know how he does it. I serve on the city council, I serve on the CRA like we all do, I'm on the Boy. Tampa Theater Board, the Stras Board, I've been on the TPO for nine years, um, I'm on the what, Museum of Art, The you know, so many boards, so many, and I wish I could serve on more boards because I love this job. This is not a part-time job, you know, some people have approached my mother and they say, oh, your son only works on Thursdays. <laughs> well, why do you, you never see my son because my son, she says, is somewhere. Then there's the neighborhood meetings. Then there's meetings after work. Then there's events. The events are, are the good part. But other than that, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, I voted against salary increases, I think, since the beginning. I've been criticized for it. I've been praised for it, whatever. Uh, I've had discussions with my, my wife about it. Um, one thing that, did, that, that Councilman Miranda brought up was in 2008 to 2014, there was a recession. And we laid off a lot of people. And, Mayor Iorio, and I give her credit, because she did a great job. She made a lot of tough decisions. Um, there was a gap there of six years of the salary that wasn't increased. Perhaps we can look at what, if we were to stayed on the increase from 2007 and, and, and factor in the, the missing gap of 2008 to 2014 and get ourselves back to that level, Maybe we would be at 60,000, you know, because I said when I started here it was 43 and now it's over 50. I mean, it, that's a more reasonable balance. Um, we've approved salary increases for the, uh, the, the collective bargaining uh, <laughs> individuals, the different unions, although their job is in a totally different capacity. I mean, I don't compare anything I do to public safety or ATU because they work 100 times harder and it's a totally different, uh, you know, sacrifice. Um, I would be open to the discussion uh, when we bring this back at the end of March with the full council. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's right to vote on anything today. Um, I would be open to the discussion of these salaries kick in in the next uh, cycle and then after the 2027 folks. So if we have more people that want to run, they can say, hey, you know, we can make this much money. Um, I don't know if I'm ready to accept a salary increase starting in May, starting now. I, I live within what I, what I make and I'm fine with it. I know what I signed up with, but I understand the argument of there are individuals that can't do this because they can't afford to do it. And there's good people out there, a lot of good people in this community that want to run. Uh, again, I'm not committing yes or no, uh, but I'm open to uh, different ideas that we have. I know we're looking at 3%, you know, standard cost of living increase. Um, but that's it. I'm not going to go into, well, you know, you know, philosophical things, this and that. I'm looking at this uh, realistically. But again, I will keep an open mind in the discussion for March 28th. Um, and I'll leave it at that. I know Mr. O'Hara is standing by as our CFO. Yes. I want to say something. Hi, Dennis. And I want to say something. Yes. Well. Council Member Vieira, Council Member Anderson. Yeah. And, and I, again, I wanted to stress something that council members have said, which is, uh, the great amount of work that goes into this job. I was a um, full-time lawyer for 13 years and decided to run for office. And, um, you know, it's, it's a hard balance. I, I, I will say, and now I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm of counsel, I'm a part-time lawyer, and cut back my uh, practice 50%, and that's always difficult. Um, but the, probably the one that has it the toughest, I would probably say, and, and maybe I'm wrong, is Councilwoman Henderson, who's a, a teacher. That's That's... That's a, I mean, my, my, my hat's off to you for that balance that you have uh, and, and everything. So again, you know, something that Councilman Maniscalco said, it, it, and I want to emphasize that's my position, which is after 27, if, if the goal is, right, to attract more people, then, you know, I, I support it after 27, uh, some level. So that's all. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Councilman uh, Henderson. Well, I, I disagree with that. I don't think you need to wait another election cycle because that's the excuse that was used uh, for you all not selecting, um, deciding on the $75,000 salary is that, you know, it was politicized and, you know, you, you all didn't want to move forward with it. You voted, I think it was 43. The bottom line is there's also a couple of other things that people don't know um, about this, this job 
that I just want to say publicly is that even when you're invited places, especially to hotels, you have to pay the $30 to park. Every organization, not every organization, but nine times out of ten organizations also are asking you to support their organization financially. They think that we actually have money in our budget. Um, I don't know why, but that is the case. I get so many financial requests from organizations and individuals asking me to support things. And to date, I went and looked at it, you know, for tax purposes, um, you know, I've given out about $4,000, um, you know, based on things that I was invited to as the councilwoman. I've raised my paddle. I've donated funds. So we're even asked, um, and I was with some council members, and they say, no, you don't have to do that. Our presence is what's important. And that may be true, but I did feel compelled because I believe in these organizations to support them. I pay for parking. <laughs> I have to find something to wear and figure it out. So there are a lot of different other things that factor into this. We can't be afraid um, to give ourselves a raise. The Florida, Florida State of Representatives, you know why they stay at $25,000 a year? Because you, one of the primary reasons why they do it is because they want to keep it pigeonholed that only the rich can afford to serve in our Florida House of Representatives. Yep. If you are at that level, making $25,000 a year, tra traveling back and forth to city um, to, 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 um, to the great city of Tallahassee, um, it is a huge sacrifice, and there are people that I know, I've asked them, they are in law, they practice, they, they, they only have been reduced to a certain amount of billable hours because of the nature of the job. So it is a huge public service sacrifice, and it doesn't have to be. The quality of the work that you receive when you hear us saying that, we yes, we read your emails, we read, we prepare with staff, we have meetings, we also participate with the public, we go to these events, Really, the study of bringing us to $75,000 is just really what it's saying is that, you know what, what we're paying you, you're actually behind. So asking for the raise right now is just bringing you to the present. And you can't be afraid to do that. No one is going to hold, well, I'm, I can't speak for the entire public, but I just don't think that we should be afraid to take that step. I actually, as an educator, I've been fortunate to be in a new position where I'm not connected to a classroom every day and I've been given the grace to actually um, have Thursdays where I'm able to attend meeting. But it was brought up before when we were looking at a different schedule. I don't know if y'all recall that. I said I can't do that because my job has already given me the sacrifice of, of, of having the flexible schedule for Thursdays. And I actually love being on council. And I do bring a fresh perspective. Um, I am a different voice. I recognize that. And so bringing the salary up to date, it's just that there's just nothing wrong with that. There's just nothing wrong with that. There is a reason why there's only been 16 women on council. Only 16. I'm number 16. There's a reason behind that. There's a reason why you may not see the diversity in not just in, in age, but in, 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 in a variety of ways. Um, economic background. You know, all, all of us, I think, have a college degree. You know, that's not necessarily a requirement for council. But we are professionals in our own right. And even just that alone. The fact that we actually are college educated definitely lets you know that we are behind the mark when it comes to a salary. So I do look forward to you know continuing the conversation and I appreciate us being very transparent about it and speaking in front of the camera so that the public can hear what we have to say. Thank you very much. Councilmember Clendenin, you had a question for Mr. Rojero? Yeah. Mr. Rojero, can you hear me? I have a question I, I, you needed to I, answer. I, I feel like I, I have to talk to you because you took your time out to be with us here today. So I hope you're doing well. Um, a question for you. If, if this council on, um, what did we say, March 28th? Is that, I, what I, I apologize. Yes, I can hear you. I couldn't okay, uh, good. get off. If uh, this council on March 28th elected to implement uh, the chief of staff's proposal that he had brought forth before, um, would the current budget accommodate that? And uh, just to clarify, the uh, is that the seventy-five thousand dollars salary? I, I I don't even remember. I said fifteen percent so, earlier, but, and I said we calculate that. But but I, I mean, but I I still I still go with the fact that we have a we have a statistical analysis prepared by an independent party, um, and I think that that I think that's a hard document that we can go with. Um, 
that just makes and, sense and, to me. So let's say that is the ceiling. If that if that proposal, because that's the that's the best or worst case scenario, depending on which side of this argument you're on, uh, if that was to pass this council, would the city the 2024 fiscal year budget accommodate that? Yes, we could accommodate that. Thank you. Appreciate it. I hope you have a beautiful weekend. Councilmember Henderson, you had a question. Thank Council you. Member yeah, Henderson. I asked him a similar question, so he answered it even based on. Uh, yes. Just based on um, Councilman Clendenden's um, question, he answered it for me as well. So, because my mouth was lower. Council Thank Member you. Miranda. You're welcome, Council. Hundred thousand dollars salary. The so, budget. <laughs> I'm buying drinks tonight. No, no, I want to know. You woke up to buying. Would it accommodate a hundred thousand dollars salary? The answer is going to be yes. Dennis? Mr. O'Hara, would it accommodate? Yes, I, I, I apologize. The specific question? Mr. O'Hara, would the budget accommodate a $100,000 salary? Yes. Thank you very much. All right, anything else? If not, all right, we're going to revisit this March 28th under staff reports. We need a motion. Oh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, so this is a discussion, <coughs> no formal action, a discussion on March 20th when we have a full council. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I believe part of that motion was to have this first under staff. Yes. Yeah, right under administration. <coughs> My question okay. to you yes. um, is how much time do you anticipate putting towards that because... 30 minutes. No more than? Yeah, I, just, I think 30 minutes is good. We're going to throw down the opponents and beat them up between now and March 28th. There are, no, there are no opponents, Mr. Chairman. Correct. There are people who are more realistic than others. However, let me say this. If anything, if this is, the only one's going to help here is me. Because your retirement's based on your salary for the last five years times one and a half. So there's no, and it, just so that, let me just say that for the record. Thank you very much. You'll have a nice day. Thank, thank you very much. Good. And thank you for your data. Mr. Mr. Shelby, yes. that concludes the agenda. <coughs> Yes. But I have, I have a, a memo from a Mr. Martin Shelby. Yes. Um, now this is uh, regarding uh, Staff Force and Unfinished Business. You would like to add this item to the March 28th agenda, is that correct? Yes, and the legal department has prepared a motion if somebody's willing to read that. And second okay. And that Council Member Henderson? Uh, Wait, uh, see. Before we go. go. Sorry, before yeah. you move on. Council Member Henderson. Well, why, don't, why don't we wait for the motion to be on the floor? Right, okay. Uh, motion to add to the March 28, 2024 City <coughs> Council regular session, ad session agenda under staff reports and unfinished business pursuant to ordinance number 2023-167, consideration of the request made by formal council, City Council member Orlando Goods for reimbursement of attorney's fees and costs associated with the lawsuit captioned LS through her parents SH and SH individually versus Orlando Goods, case number 22 CA 4051. Second. We have a motion from Councilmember Hertak, second from Councilmember Clendenin, and we go to Councilmember Henderson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have completed my first form 8B. I am going to um, abstain to avoid the appearance of a potential conflict of interest where a relative is associated with this case. We have a, okay, let's Move take the motion to receive and file. Uh, that's my first one. Motion to receive and file from Council Member uh, Henderson, second Council Member Vieira. Wait, all in favor? Aye. 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 So we, now we vote on bringing this back on March 28th. Yes. yes. And I get to leave. You yes. don't have to leave. No. Right now. It's only going to no. take, yeah. take a minute. Yeah. Second. We have a motion from and Council Member Hertek. We have a second from Council Member Clendenin. Yes, Council Member. I remember March 28th, just since we're going to have one Council Member missing, just in case that I'm going to have to miss part of the morning Council that day. So just, I mean, I, it'll this be, will be staff, staff report. Okay, oh, I just say that just in case. He's missing out. All, right. okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that concludes everything. If we could have that announced. If we could have that announced, Wait, please. Lisa, can you come out here real quick? No, if we could have, no, no, the, clerk, no, if we could have the clerk announce that vote is what I'm asking. Okay. Yes, please. Motion carried unanimously with Carlson being absent. And? At vote. Henderson. And Henderson abstaining. And Henderson abstaining from the vote. There Thank you go. You. That's why I asked. Thank you. All right. I have a question <coughs> for my aide, Lisa, regarding some new business. So if she could come out. Council Member Miranda. Yes, sir. I would like to make a motion to present a combination to Abbott 
Elementary uh, Academy, excuse me, and Lydian Hurd, a student at the Academy of Holy Names, who are medal winners at the 22-23 USSA Tampa Post Number Five American Legion Oratorical Contest. These medals have been received and are a reflection of their keen interest in the appreciation of the values of outline in the Constitution of the United States and their awareness of the responsibility incumbent on each citizen to exercise and protect these rights. In conjunction with this, I would like to uh, present two combinations to the American Heritage Girls, Abby Ko Kowalski and Charlotte Luria, who have earned their citizenship and government <coughs> badges for the knowledge and understanding of civic responsibility. I would like to present these combinations at the beginning of the evening of March 28th at 5.01 if possible. Second. We have a motion from Councilmember Miranda. We have a second from Councilmember Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Anything else, sir? That's it. Councilman Vieira, you have a list. Yes, sir. No, just a couple <laughs> quick ones. Actually, this is going to shorten the agenda. On February 22nd, I, I had uh, something on disability housing for workshop. I want to take that off um, because of ongoing talks with the Hive Project. All right, we have it's a motion kind from Councilmember Vieira. Vieira. Second, second from? Second. Second from Councilmember Clendenin. And this is to remove the item regarding disability housing uh, on February 22nd. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then quickly, if I may, um, many of us know the uh, Boone Stoppel family, yes. uh, the late um, Harrison, uh, who was uh, killed in Ybor City. And I, I before uh, that, that terrible tragedy, I had come into contact with the family. I, I spoke at uh, the late Harrison's um, graduation at Pepin Academy, uh, where he was a very, very proud graduate. Um, God rest his soul. And I've been talking to the parents about uh, some ideas to uh, commemorate their late son, who was just an amazing young man. I mean, he, I, I, as, as a father, um, the, the, the work that it took into that young man with his challenges, he uh, won't go into it. The Tampa Bay Times did a great profile on him. Uh, he had special needs and um, just everything those those parents and that family had went into them and in new tampa we have our um all abilities park in uh, new tampa which is not named um and i want to ask uh, the administration for consideration of uh, renaming that park or naming that park um after the late harrison and we can have that come back in time to give and i see mr massey uh, standing up uh, there may be some um i think yes sir. has a previously motion to to kind of put a hiatus on renaming things until and, we have a yeah. discussion and, and so about the naming process. We'll back. That's what I was going to yeah. say is, so when does that come back to us? Because if you remember when Councilwoman Henderson made that motion, I, I didn't say that that one, you knew you were going to do that one. You, well, yeah, because I, you want to, you know, talk with um, the families, et cetera, on that issue. And, um, and uh, yeah, so when, when does that come back? Uh, if you know Mr. Massey or Mr. Shelby? The clerk may know. I th I, I'm thinking it's April sometime. Okay. That comes so back. how about this? I'll, I'll, I'll have it come back to us in June um, after that, after we dedicate or deal with that. And then if I have to delay it more um, so that we can have that discussion, that's fine. And it's just for consideration. We have a motion from Council Member Vieira. Let me look at the June dates here. I don't know. I'm looking for all of them, but I see that there are staff reports, including namings of several properties on the April 4th staff reports. But we're we're that looking uh, after so. April. I think yeah, all yeah, those that, will be continued be because there's going to be a whole yeah. naming discussion. I want to be June 6th. I, I, for some there reason, I think go. the April workshop was the, the, the date that was scheduled for the discussion about the naming yep. issue. Yeah. I may be uh, wrong. Can, I, I, can I speak to that? Yes. yes. Uh, Honestly, Councilman, can we ask that you not make that motion today and bring it back to us after yeah. we have that April discussion? Th this I feel is much more. I feel more comfortable with that. I, I'll be honest with you, and I appreciate that. Uh, we can put a pin in it in terms of waiting for the April one. I, I just in full transparency, I promised the family I'd make the motion today, uh, so I, I, I wouldn't yeah. want that. I understand, but we we did reach an agreement not you know to put a hold on this stuff. Yeah. So it was council procedures that we're putting a hold on the stuff, and that we're we're gonna and we're gonna have this discussion on April. Yeah. So maybe you could go back to them and say, hey, you know, we had we had had some issues with renaming. So we're and we're gonna have the council is gonna meet in April. I'll promise you, I'll bring it back after April. How about this council? Because again, I, I gave them my word, and I do want to go forward as I, I do the motion consistent with 
whatever decision we make at the April uh, uh, meeting. And again, if there's something that requires more time, glad to make that. I just want to put it out there for the family. It's a, it's a promise I made them, and I, I you know, want to go through with it. And again, my intent is if council changes any procedures in April, um, then, then I can amend my motion. So you, you have my word, it will be consistent with it. Because again, for me, I, I, we've been talking about this with the family for a while, and I want to be true to my word for them. Yes, ma'am. And I'm going to echo what um, Councilman Clendenin said. I mean, we just we don't even know what our new rules are going to be. I, mm -hmm. I, I, while I feel for the family, I, I, what I don't want is for this issue to become the the thing that that I, I don't want this renaming to be the one that kind of has to go through the ringer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Be caught. I would prefer us to have the, the rules we want mm -hmm. and then have that be the first one and then that follows the, the rules. I, I just, I don't want them to get moved and moved and moved and then the, the family feel disrespected. I, I'm not comfortable. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, I don't want, I don't want anyone to, uh, uh, you know, proceed with a vote they feel uncomfortable in. Again, I gave my word to the family for that. I said it when we passed this, when I voted for the, um, uh, motion by Councilman Henderson that I do have one that I'll bring up at the appropriate time shortly. That's what I'm doing now. And again, it would be consistent with what we do in April. Um, and again, if we change the rules, whatever it may be, then we'll have that go through. But I want that still to be on the docket, if you will, for June. We can even make it to July if Council August uh, to give Council enough time. I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm fine with more time. And just to clarify, uh, Ms. Elman just. Uh, texted me may 25th is the workshop mm -hmm. that we're going to talk about the naming 23rd. thank you process. so how about then but, if i may august but but here's here's what the motion says council to review and discuss the process for honorary naming of city-owned property as set forth in the honorary naming ordinance further that council suspends consideration of any renaming of city-owned land and request the mayor to do the same until the yep. discussion takes place I, I interpret that as being that council may not finalize any renaming during that time. I don't interpret that as saying that we can't have a placeholder for consideration. This does not rename. This merely has uh, consideration in the future. And again, I'm glad if this is in May, I'm glad to have it in um, the first week in September. Um, and if we do something, then I can amend it at that time merely as a placeholder. Fair enough. We have a motion from Councilmember Vieira, so this would be for September, but yes. you'd be amenable to Absolutely. modifying it yeah. considering yes, what sir. will take place. You're not finalized, you're just yeah. you're putting a, a, a place an earmark, a place yes, it. We have a motion from Councilmember Vieira. How about where does it what's the latest it goes to? Let's do it in August. And again, I'll with the intent to July, push it out. July is the last there you go. July 18th. There you go. July. And again, I'll be glad to at the obviously it'll be on my mind. No, in May. Yeah, July. Y yeah. And then I can amend my motion at that time. All right. We have a motion from Councilman Vieira. Second from? I'll second it for discussion. Second from Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Nay. It, you know, it makes me feel uncomfortable because. Motion. Oh, we already voted. Motion carried with Henderson and Hertzek voting no. And Clendenin. Oh, I didn't hear. Yeah, it was a So I'll bring it up then next week. All right. It's. Bring it up and choose. Motion. I, yeah, yeah. But Motion you failed with. Sorry. With Henderson, Hertzek, and Clendenin voting no. Right. And else yes, sir. Two more. Um, there's. I was approached, and I and we can't have these discussions, right, uh, privately. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I, I, for the West Tampa Little League monument on the city doing improvements, and this is one of those discussions you have to have in public, right? Uh, that Councilman Miranda uh, represents that area, and to me, is the mayor of West Tampa and the mayor of baseball. And uh, help everybody. The mayor and, of and, baseball. And so, uh, Councilman Miranda, do you want to make that? No, motion? you can make it. Go okay. on. I'll second it. Thank you, sir. Again, I, I didn't want to appear to be disrespectful. No. Um, so I move for staff to report on having the West Tampa Little League monument um, restored and have a, uh, a report back to us on the feasibility second. of that in, uh, what are we in, uh, February, let's say, in the first week in May. That's a great day. That's an easy yes. <laughs> it's seconded by Miranda. We have a Let's motion. Yeah, Is it really bad? But Guido's running around. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. May 2nd. 
There you go. Motion from Councilmember Vieira with the second Councilmember Moran. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And then lastly, this is not a motion uh, per se. I went on um, WFLA, it was a black history uh, interview, and I was asked a number of questions on that uh, uh, program that will be airing, I guess it was on Saturday, and I was asked about the uh, Racial Reconciliation Committee, and I gave an answer to it, which was that I support it. So, um, you know, I, I do think it's something that we're going to have to discuss, Council, um, and I know members have spoken out on that, and I, and I respect everyone's opinion. I don't think anybody poses the idea of a, of a committee. I think it's uh, something that people want more uh, definition on. And, and I do believe that we should have further discussions on this during motion time. You know, my thoughts very briefly are that we should, and I said this in the interview, have specific issues that will be discussed by committee members. Things like, I wrote down affordable housing, returning citizens, uh, economic empowerment, and development and training, school to prison pipeline, historical truth telling, restoration of rights and civic participation. Um, you know, if we highlight the issues that this committee with uh, uh, folks uh, appointed by Mayor Castro, folks appointed by Tampa City Council, I think that is something that would be very good that we should, you know, jump towards as a city. I say this because again, I was asked about it in an interview, I gave my opinion, uh, and I do think it's something that we should uh, move forward on as a Tampa City Council and I, I will be discussing it with the mayor's office. Okay, council Member Clendenin and Council oh. Member Hurtag. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't on council when that resolution was passed. However, um, if I read it correctly, it's something that the administration is, is tasked with creating, correct? No. I, I, think, I, I think we as a, as a I mean, I, I agree with you, Councilman Beer. I think that we, um, it is a worthy agenda. I would encourage the administration to compile, to live to that. To that expectation, uh, I would add um, jobs and specifically nice youth, youth jobs to to that list. Uh, I think that is an important element as we move the city of Tampa forward. Um, I see that our attorney is standing. In I front just of want us. to clarify for for the record that was a city council yeah, resolution that was not initiated by the administration. I know it wasn't administered, but so, I believe that the, the amendment referred to the administration as far as creating that committee. Is I, 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 then that was that was going to be my question, but I had my hand up before. But okay, um, <laughs> it, uh, some, uh, somebody who has the organizational history did that resolution just call for the administration to create the committee? Okay, hey, again, general support. Of its Wait a second. Can, can I ask my question? You ask the chair. I can ask you a question. Not Go me. Ahead. I just want to know. Uh, my question is: to whom? Who's to to Mr. Shelby or Mr. Massey? Yes. Who creates commissions? Because I thought we had a huge thing about it in the charter, and that council cannot create a commission. Right. That's well, what I thought too. Well, that. Yeah. And, and, so who creates a commission yes. so First we can all, finish this discussion? I can, I, two points, if I can, with that, because I'm familiar with that resolution. Five sixty-eight. Um, pardon. Five sixty-eight. Two thousand twenty. <laughs> Dash 568. <laughs> so if anybody you. wants to find it, they need to know the year. It's 2020-568. The resolution, particularly in Section 3, which is quite often referenced by the public, City Council supports the creation of. Right. Yes. That, and that was specifically purposeful language because City Council had neither the budget nor the staff to do it. And I should also point out, as Council Member Clandedon has learned, the Council Member who proposes the motion their legislative aid is the one who's responsible for, uh, right. for, for facilitating it as the way it's set up unless the administration does it because the administration has the resources. I don't know what the mayor's position is. Councilman Vieira st st stated he was going to be in touch with the administration. But I do recall specifically at the time it did not say that council would create the committee. It said that they would well, support the creation. So I, the, would, now, would it, now, that doesn't preclude you from doing it. So would it be in order for this council to reconfirm our support for the creation of a committee? Again, the question is, who creates committees? Can someone please just... We, we don't. We that, that's what I thought. But again, yeah, can, I, can we just get some clarification on who can create a committee? I think what the charter provides is that committees can be created by city council resolution with the approval of the mayor. So it requires okay. both parties really to do so that. So then, in this then case. I would suggest you reach out to the administration to see if that's something they'd be willing to do. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anything else? Council, I mean, let me ask you all, do you want me to 
make a motion as a formal request to the mayor on the issues I've just brought Wait forward. Wait for all seven of us to be here. You said it was not a motion. Just yeah, said I'm just asking that because he seemed to no. have some support. Let's wait for a full council. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, to be clear, my the issues I talked about were just for the, the record of administration, affordable housing, returning citizens, economic empowerment, development, school to prison, pipeline for our youth, historical truth telling and restoration of rights and civic participation. And jobs, specifically yeah. youth jobs. And that's under <laughs> school to prison. May I may I ask yeah. a question? Well, because this you raise a you raise an interesting thing because you make reference to resolution two thousand twenty dash five sixty eight. Mm -hmm. That resolution specifically talks about certain things that the council mm -hmm. put in and writing that I think I, may be different. Or, but what I'm saying to you is that that may be in conflict or in, in addition to. And, and Mr. Shelby, I appreciate that, but that's why I made my motion. So yes, that's what. Or strike that. That's why I gave the language. So I appreciate your thoughts, but I did that for a reason. Thank you very much, yeah. Council Member Henderson. Do you have any business? Yes. Well, I, I want to comment on this. Um, um, this very, very, very tough and challenging um, resolution. Are we going to reckon with the history of racism is the question. Um, this was done September 2020, 41 months ago, and it took uh, to last week. Last week became the very first time this council actually said something about it since signing the resolution 41 months ago because I did say something under you know, when it was my turn under not new yeah, under new business, is this what this next part is called? Yeah. And so I just want you all to be very mindful that, you know, you've put a pen in it for 41 months. It is a very, very challenging topic. It requires a lot of expertise. And so a, a blanket committee um, where we decide on who those folks are going to be. I just think you, I think you need to take a lot of things into consideration when you even decide if we are going to adopt a committee and have the mayor sign off on it, that you got to take a lot of things into consideration. So start doing your research because there's a lot of things out there about reparations and, and, and racism and how we go about handling this. I'm just, um, <clears throat> you know, not okay with it in terms of, um, how we go about sanitizing history and putting a pin on it and naming out a few things and thinking that we, this body, has the expertise to solve those problems or to appoint people to solve those problems. It is a very complex situation. On to the new business, I actually would like to, um, just a couple of things, I would like to um, do one of my rare commendations for um, the Women's History Committee. I would like to provide a commendation to them for their 27th annual Women's History Month celebration on March 5th. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any okay. Opposed? Anyway, no one opposed to Women's History Month. That's next month. Okay. So, um, also, I would just like to recognize um, here in Hillsborough County Public Schools the um, results have come out for the state of Florida for the best high schools. And we have a few that are in the top 50 and a few in the top um, 200. So I just want to call those schools out and say congratulations because it's about not only your graduation rate, but your college readiness. So congratulations to Plant High School for being ranked number 35, Newsom High School number 49, and others under in the top 200 are Steinbrenner, Robinson Sickles, Strawberry Crest, Tampa Bay Tech, Alonzo, Bloomingdale, Hillsborough, Riverview, Middleton, and Lato. So there are some people that need to get to work and their colors are blue and gold. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that is the other thing. And then lastly, um, this weekend, there is a, um, th there is the Gasparillo Music Festival as, as well as the Black Love Play at the Tampa Theater. And um, that is something, you know, um, that you, um, the community can take into consideration in supporting. Other than that, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I made a motion the other day, but I didn't wait, clarify the wait, date. Wait, wait, wait. The, the chair pro tem recognizes Chairman Maniscalco. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very professional. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to amend uh, a motion that I made to give the accommodation to Tampa Pride. The date was for March 7th. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Chairman Maniscalco, a second from Chairman, uh, Councilman Miranda former Chairman Miranda. Mm -hmm. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you very much. Is that it? Oh, and a very happy early birthday to Mr. Martin Shelby. Happy birthday. It's in a couple of days. Council Member Clinton. 
I have nothing. Council Member Hurtag. Thank you. Uh, I motion to have uh, mobility staff send a memo to, to council members outlining the city's transportation improvement plan, better known as TIP priorities, before they are sent to the transportation planning organization, the TPO staff in March. Second. We have a motion from uh, Councilmember Clinton, uh, her text second, Councilmember Miranda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, and that's really because as transportation becomes an issue, I really want all of us to have knowledge about what's going into it some of us sit on heart some of us sit on tpo mm -hmm. let's start to have these conversations um and i was going to ask for a motion for a vote but i think this is a good start and maybe next year we can bring up um, motions for votes uh so this motion will make further discussion of mobility pri priorities unnecessary at this time so i motion to remove the staff report from the the february 22nd workshop uh, agenda that I made in July of 2023 that staff to have a discussion on mobility needs and priorities. We have a motion from Council Member Hurtag, second Council Member Clendenin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And the six pilot project uh, are, is done. So I motion to have staff uh, give a brief five minute report on the results of the six pilot project on May 16th, 2024. We have a motion from Council Member Hurtag, second Council Member Clendenin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anything else? Councilmember Carlson? No. Nope. Motion to receive and file? Yes. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. Yes, Councilmember Hurtag? I was just going to say, um, we, I, I think I can speak for all of us when I send best wishes to Councilmember Carlson. Hope he feels better soon. Thank you very much. Yes, I'll second that. Councilmember, uh, Mr. Shelby. Thank you. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Uh, an email came in that was brought to my attention about, uh, oh, about an hour, hour or so ago. Mm -hmm an invitation to a community meeting that's being held on March 6th at 5.30 B p.m. at Hyde House Gallery in Hyde Park Village. It uh, involves um, a vision for Willow Avenue between Platt and Swan, and it turns out that in attendance will be those from City of Tampa Mobility, TECO, T-H-E-A, Hillsborough Planning Commission, uh, I guess ARC, so uh, would be there, and other attendees, and it says the meeting um, the gentleman who sent this, the meeting will introduce a vision of this area of the city that works into plans being implemented or finalized by mobility, THEA, TECO, or other entities. And I suspect that somewhere in that process, city council is a necessary partner. One would think, I don't know, but the question is, can city council attend? And I, if the answer to that, I would think would be yes. My suggestion is you just please be mindful that if it's something that could reasonably come before a city council that you do not engage in discussion amongst yourselves or in public with each other and you remain mindful of the uh, requirements of the sunshine law but certainly if this is something that involves all these entities including mobility my sense is that it also will involve city council Understood. let's Thank have you. a long discussion I, 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 yeah i have a question because i'm confused i was looking at our monitor it says february 15 2024 4 colon 5 8 and then there's a letter that I'm not used to seeing. It says PM and not AM. Is that a typo? Because we're, we're, we're leaving city council at, at it's not 4.59 AM in the morning? Is that? I wish it were. Okay. But I'm if you have, I'm sorry, that's a joke. I, well, I'm sorry, that, that's a, that, that's a joke. A I'm not, to I'm not, I don't think I'm allowed to joke anymore. A second. second. Second council member Clendenin, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. And if there were a night meeting council member, you'd be starting in one minute. <laughs>